need the staff's cooperation. We don't have a lot of room in this uh, particular space. We're, we're going to be broadcasting the meeting live next door. So please, staff, if you can go next door and watch it from there. Thank you so much. Uh, Okay. Good afternoon. I'm the chair of the Committee on Governmental Operation, Council Member Fernando Cabrera. Today we are meeting jointly with the Committee on Economic Development and the Committee on Transportation, chaired by my colleagues, Council Member Paul Vallone and Idanis Rodriguez, respectively. A first hearing on legislation by Council Member Debbie Rose, Introduction 982 of 2018, in relation to establishing an office of the waterfront, and legislation by Chair Vallone, Introduction 1512, in relation to the establishment of a director of ferry operations. New York City has approximately 520 miles of waterfront, a geographic asset that has helped make it a major commercial and industrial center. Many agencies from the city, state, and federal governments have a hand in regulating the industrial, commercial, residential, and recreational uses of wars, waterfront, prop, uh, waterfront property, waterfront infrastructure, as well as making our waterfront more resilient to st strong storms and flooding. Introduction 982 by Council Member Rose will create a single city agency, an office of the waterfront, to track and manage the work of these various agencies. Under the bill, this office will coordinate the implementation of the New York City Comprehensive Waterfront Plan and Waterfront front Action Agenda. The office will serve as the public's primary point of contact for all the matters related to the waterfront. It will coordinate and collaborate with city agencies responsible for issuing permits and distributing information related to the waterfront and will be a liaison to state and federal agencies involved in waterfront uh, permitting. Finally, the office will also assist the Waterfront Management Advisory Board as it advises on matters relating to waterfront use and will annually make recommendations for addressing issues affecting use of the waterfronts. I would like to thank committee staff whose work made this hearing possible. Alex Polonoff, Emily Forjom, Daniel Collins, Elizabeth Cron, James D Giovanni, Elliot Lynn, Rick Arbello, Emily Rooney, as well as my own legislative uh, director, Claire McClavey. And with that, let me now uh, turn it over to Chair Vallone to make some opening remarks and to speak on his legislation. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Councilman Vallone, Chair of Economic Development Committee. Happy to be joining my colleagues, Fernando Cabrera, Idanis Rodriguez, and co-chairing today's hearing. As Chair Cabrera mentioned, today's hearing will focus on two pieces of legislation regarding the city's waterfront areas. I've joined both of my colleagues in signing on to Councilmember Rose Introduction 982, which would also create an office of the waterfront. I think we can all agree that the establishment of such an office is long overdue, and the bill would give the city's waterfront areas the attention they finally deserve. This bill would designate an office to act as a clearinghouse for waterfront issues such as permitting, environmental protection, and recreation. Uh, we will turn over the floor to Councilmember Rose in a moment to discuss her bill. We're also here to discuss Intro 1512, a bill I've introduced to establish a director of ferry services who would be responsible for the administration and management of all of the city's ferries other than the Staten Island Ferry. This responsibility would also include the evaluation of existing ferry sites as well as development of new sites for the expansion of ferry service. The Director of Ferry Services would be appointed by the Commissioner of Transportation and would be delegated several of the Commissioner's charter responsibilities regarding ferries. The Director would have authority over the control of ferry boats, terminals, wharves, as well as the collection of fares. These responsibilities would apply to nearly all of the city's ferries, including those currently in contract with the city's Economic Development Corporation. At the moment, however, EDC is in contract with Hornblower Cruises to operate its ferries. As we understand it, the EDC is currently in a six-year options contract that expires in 2023. As part of that contract, the city can purchase the ferries from Hornblower at any time prior to the end of the contract. In order to comply with this legislation before the committee today, we would advise EDC to exercise a component of their options contract. 
By owning and operating ferries, the city can reshape New York City ferry into a more effective and streamlined system that reduces the burdens on EDC and allows for an appropriate amount of community engagement into the site selection and pricing of ferry services. In the future, ferry boats themselves would be selected by sealed competitive bid procurements through the DOT, and they would be subject to the same contract oversight as any other city agency. This would reduce the cost for ferry operations while ensuring the appropriate agency can focus on seamlessly connecting New York City ferry system to existing transit options. We can agree the ultimate goal is to establish a self-sustaining citywide ferry system that connects all five boroughs using the city's redundant abundant waterways. We believe the best can be achieved by granting ferry authority to an agency entity in the form of the Director of Ferry Operations. EDC has done its part in launching the New York City ferry system, but now it is time for the city to shoulder their responsibility. I believe these bills, when considered together, can transform our waterways and waterfront areas for the best. We look forward to hearing feedback on the bills from waterfront advocates as well as EDC, the Department of Transportation, and the Department of City Planning. Before I turn the floor over to my co-chair, Adonis Rodriguez, I'd just like to take a minute to acknowledge the staff of all three committees, Legislative Councils Alex Polinoff, Danielle Collins, James DiGiovanni, and Elliot Lynn, Policy Analysts Emily Forgione, Elizabeth Cronk, Emily Rooney, Rick Arbello, and Finance Analyst Aliyah Ali, Zachary Harris, and John Bastille. Thank you, all of you, for putting hard work to make this hearing together. Joint hearings are never, ever easy. With that, Chair Rodriguez, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Cabrera, eh, Balon. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's hearing. Annie Danis Rodriguez, the Chair of the Committee of Transportation. First, let me be clear. Ferry is not a luxury mode of transportation. It adds to a bus, train, bike transportation, and they are very important. And as we are today discussing, uh, and I had the honor to be co prime together with Council Member Ballon, to transfer the control of the ferry transportation to DOT, my approach, our approach, is to continue expanding our ferry service in the city of New York. I do believe that as we will celebrate Earth Day on the 22nd, we have to continue working in, with one goal, to reduce the numbers of New Yorkers that own cars. Today, 1.4 million New Yorkers own vehicles. We can reduce the number to 1 million by 2030. This is something that I've been working with different stakeholders in the city agency, and I will continue working with my colleague. Again, we will address different questions, different issues when it comes to our ferries, but we would like to continue adding the ferry services, not to reduce and to expanding and to look at the transportation desert that we have and see how they, how they can play an important role. As you have heard, today the Committee on Transportation, Economic Development, and Government Operation will hear two bills related to the city's waterfronts. First, Council Member Ross Intro 92 will establish an office of the waterfront. I'm proud to be among the many co sponsors of this important piece of legislation, and I look forward to hearing the administration's testimony on this matter. But as a chair of the Transportation Committee, I will focus on introduction number 1512, which I had the honor to be a co prime together with Council Member Ballon. This bill will establish a director of ferry services within the Department of Transportation, which would give DOT control of all city, city, city's ferries. New York City Ferry has been a welcome addition to the New York City transit infrastructure, but it has not been without criticism. And as New Yorkers, we also have to be ready to take criticism. According to the recent report by the Citizens Voyage Commission, ferry trips are subsidized by city at over $10 per trip, trip, which is more than double the per trip public subsidy for the city's buses and 10 times more than the subsidy for the subway trip. Expansion are welcomed by many communities. I am one of those who would like to see a ferry going from Battery Plaza all the way to 72nd, uh, 125th, under the George Washington Bridge, Inwood, and even Riverdale. And this is something that my colleague has signed letters in the past asking for the city to explore that possibility. New York City Ferry serves many high-income areas that are arguably already well served by, the, by, the, by public transit. 
and we know little about any demographic data that EDC may have on ridership. And this is a fair question that we will have, and we hope that we will work, work with, the, with the EDC and later on with DOT to get more information. We want a more transparent system so that we know how city funds are being spent and what populations we are serving. Intro 1512 proposed a simple question. Could the city operate a ferry better itself with greater efficiency and transparency than EDC and a private contractor? I believe that this is a question we need to think carefully about. And I'm looking forward to hearing testimony from the administration and stakeholders on this topic. Thank you, Chair Cabrera and Chair Barron. Thank you so much. And now I will ask Councilmember Rose to speak on her legislation. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon. And thank you, Chairs Cabrera, Rodriguez, and Vallone, in alphabetical order, not in importance. <laughs> I want to speak briefly about my bill, Intro 982. I want you to imagine fielding a baseball team without a manager, because one thing I learned in a city council, being a city council member, is everybody likes sports metaphors, so <laughs> there's a couple. Um, fielding a, imagine fielding a baseball team without a manager, running a high school without a principal, or supervising a restaurant kitchen without a chef. At best, you'd be confused and there would be waste. At worst, chaos. Management, coordination, and leadership are crucial ingredients for success, no matter what you're trying to accomplish. But in New York City, no one is overseeing the waterways, which is why I introduced this bill last summer to establish an office of the waterfront. New York City's 520 linear miles of waterfront, once 520 miles of linear waterfront, once primarily used for ports and commerce, are now serve so many other functions parks and recreation, jobs and economic opportunity, commercial, transportation, and recreational uses. Our 21st century harbor is large, complex, increasingly busy, and fundamental to our everyday lives, and suffering from a lack of oversight. Our harbor is now home to New York's newest transportation network, NYC Ferry, with millions of passengers annually. We also have a growing community of paddling and rowing clubs. This traffic needs to be managed. While fish and marine and bird populations are reemerging, approximately 20 billion gallons of sewage continues to be dumped into the waters each year, making water quality an urgent concern. As the largest port on the eastern seaboard, our port supports 400,000 jobs, larger than more prominent sectors such as broadcasting and entertainment. Good paying jobs can be found at the city's ports, but the industry needs our advocacy. Our harbor is the first line of defense against the threat posed by climate change. Washington will, will not be a reliable ally in this fight, making local action even more crucial. These days, what passes for harbor governance is a complex web of city, state, and federal agencies that impose often confusing regulations, creating obstacles to efficient management. My hope is that an office of the waterfront will straighten out this tangle and lead, manage, and coordinate various waterfront projects and plans. Through city council legislation, we have already reconvened the Waterfront Management Advisory Board. As former chair of the Waterfronts Committee, I'm a proud member of that board. Now it's time that we formally acknowledge the role that the waterfront plays in the economic fiber of New York City by establishing an office that will have oversight and harmonize the many pieces that make up its whole. I thank my 44 colleagues who are co-sponsoring this bill, as well as the advocates who have helped us to move forward. And I look forward to a constructive discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Council Member. And uh, I want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, that today is the last, last day for SAC, Harris, and Governmental Operations, our financial analysts. Uh, come on, let's give them a big round of applause. He's the real deal. We are definitely going to miss you. And now we're going to uh, swear you in. 
you could please raise your hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. And you can be in your testimony. Introduce yourselves as you speak, please. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairs Cabrera, Rodriguez, and Ballone, again in alphabetical order, and members of the committees on government operations, transportation, and economic development. My name is James Katz, and I serve as Chief of Staff at the New York City Economic Development Corporation, also known as EDC. I'm joined by my colleague James Wong, who directs NYC Ferry, and our colleagues Mike Morella of the Department of City Planning and Rebecca Sack of the City's Department of Transportation. I'm here today to testify about in Intro 1512 and New York City Ferry and how it is improving connectivity for New Yorkers living in the city's waterfront neighborhoods. EDC is a self-sustaining nonprofit organization that works to drive and shape the city's economic growth. Our purview includes managing over 66 million square feet of real estate, building critical neighborhood infrastructure, and investing in industries and initiatives that have the potential to pay good paying jobs. We are also behind the expansion of the East River Ferry into NYC Ferry, one of the largest commuter ferry networks in the country. NYC Ferry is a direct outgrowth of EDC's legacy as chief steward of New York City's maritime assets. That role was codified in 1991 when the city charter delegated most duty, duties of the city's former Department of Ports and Terminals to EDC. Since that time, EDC has over, overseen ports and terminal investment, cruise terminal management, maritime operations support, and recreational and commercial boating issues on behalf of the city. Our work has included investing over $200 million to modernize the Manhattan Cruise Terminal, now one of the largest cruise ports in the country. This investment resulted in a significant increase in ship calls, and our ports now contribute an estimated $228 million to the city's economy annually. And together with the Port Authority, EDC led the effort to reactivate Staten Island's global container terminal by modernizing its shipping and rail operations. Today, roughly 350,000 containers are shipped annually between terminals on the New York side of the harbor. Moreover, over 500,000 tons of cargo are shipped each year through the city's maritime facilities. A significant part of EDC's maritime legacy is our work on private ferry operations. Since 1995, EDC has been responsible for maintaining and developing some city-owned piers used by various private ferries. Starting in 2011, EDC was charged with launching and overseeing the East River Ferry Pilot. The pilot successfully connected a handful of growing East River waterfront neighborhoods like Dumbo, Greenpoint, Williamsburg, and Hunters Point South in Long Island City to job centers in East Midtown and in Lower Manhattan. Seeing the potential of our waterways to become vital neighborhood connectors, Mayor de Blasio committed to expanding East River Ferry to serve additional neighborhoods. In February 2015, he announced the creation of NYC Ferry, the first major increase of ferry service in our city in more than a century. Its goal was, and remains, to provide an equitable transportation option for New Yorkers living in areas that have been underserved by public transportation. In less than 27 months from the Mayor's announcement, EDC brought the system to life. This process included planning six interconnected routes, constructing and upgrading 20 ferry landings, procuring a strong operating partner, and securing a fleet of 16 brand new purpose-built vessels. While, while we believed then that NYC Ferry would be popular, customer demand has exceeded even our wildest expectations. We originally projected that the system would serve 4.6 million riders per year uh, upon full build. But since its mid-2017 launch, it has carried over 8.5 million people. And going forward, we project that the system will serve 11 million riders annually by 2023 after expanding the Throgs Neck, the West Side, Coney Island, and Staten Island's North Shore. It seems that our customers, over 80% of whom are New Yorkers, have voted with their feet, and that response has been gratifying. Now, much has been made recently over issues involving NYC ferry costs. We welcome that conversation, and I'm sure we will have the chance to address it further today. For the moment, I will just make two points on this topic. First, Operating NYC Ferry is costly because the administration prioritized equity and accessibility when designing the system. These policy choices were made with clear intention and with resolve. In a departure from his predecessor, Mayor de Blasio directed that we peg the, the ferry system's fare to the MTAs. By keeping cost of ridership to the now familiar $2.75, we ensured that New Yorkers from many walks of life could enjoy this new mode of transportation. Further, we chose to serve far-flung places that are not well served by transit, like the Rockaways, Soundview, South Brooklyn, and coming soon, Coney Island. That all comes with a price tag, but it is in pursuit of a policy goal that I believe we all share. Second, 
the decision that the administration and EDC made in 2016 to own ferry vessels rather than lease them was unequivocally the most responsible fiscal choice for the city and its taxpayers. At the time we were planning the system's launch, there simply were not enough vessels available, either in New York Harbor or anywhere else in the country. Trust me, we looked. The cost to construct an entirely new fleet of vessels was and remains significant, but our choice at the time was simple. We could pay others for the right to rent those new boats for the term of the operator contract, and at the end, the city would be left with nothing. Alternatively, we could buy the boats ourselves and do so for nearly the exact same amount we would have paid to rent. At the end of the current contract, the city would have a tangible asset in the form of an entirely new fleet of ferry boats. And it would be able to leverage that asset to secure even better terms in the procurement for a new ferry operator. The choice was clear, and it is one we stand by. We need not wait to the end of the operating agreement to see the fruits of these decisions. Our commitments of public funds are already proving to be worthwhile. In just under three years, NYC Ferry has boosted transit capacity in traditionally neglected communities like Red Hook by 54 percent, Sound View by nearly 30 percent, and Western, and Western Astoria by nearly 54 percent. And we know more mobility for residents translates to greater opportunity. We also know that NYC Ferry has helped New Yorkers reduce their commutes by an average of 30 minutes or more from neighborhoods where subways are few and travel to work is onerous. Astoria House's resident and tenant association leader Claudia Koger has lived this experience. In a recent Daily News op-ed she wrote, it would be impossible to quantify how NYC Ferry has changed my life and the lives of my neighbors. With the system in our backyard, we can rest assured that there's a reliable mode of transportation to use and are no longer beholden to buses and subway. We could not agree more, and we hope you also agree that the ferry system has been one of the unsung success stories of these last few years. Decades from now, when history reflects on our collective legacy as policymakers, I believe this investment in our waterfront, waterfront neighborhoods will be seen as a great catalyst for inclusive growth and an important step towards transit equity. Thank you for, my, for your attention. My colleagues and I will be happy to take your question. Thank you so much. And oh, you got a test. I'm sorry. Go for it. Wait. I, would, I could read my testimony if that's okay. No, go for it. Okay. Go for it. I thought you. Good morning, were. Uh, chairs Cabrera, Rodriguez, and Valone, and members of the committees on governmental operations, transportation, and economic development. My name is Rebecca Zach, Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs at the Department at the New York City Department of Transportation, and I am joined by. Monty Dean, Chief of Staff to our Chief Operators, Operations Officer. We are glad to be here today on behalf of Commissioner Trottenberg to testify in Intro 1512. In my written testimony, I will briefly discuss the Staten Island Ferry as well as the steps we have taken to support the development of EDC's successful New York City Ferry Program. As you may be aware, we, the City of New York, have continuously operated the Staten Island Ferry since 1905 and with nearly 25 million passengers a year, our ferry division operates the largest passenger-only municipal ferry in the Western Hemisphere. We currently sail eight vessels in the fleet, which includes Kennedy, Barberi, Austin, and Molinari class boats, with carrying capacities ranging from 1,100 to 5,200 passengers. And we have plans to add three new 5,400 passenger capacity Aulis class vessels and retire some of our older boats. We make over 40,000 trips a year with an on-time performance in excess of 90%. Our vessels are U.S. Coast Guard certified and classed with American Bureau of Shipping. To sail these vessels, our captains have U.S. Coast Guard licenses for unlimited tonnage and pilotage required for the route. We operate pursuant to a certified safety management system modeled on the International Safety, Man safety Management Code and certified by the American Bureau of Shipping on behalf of the U.S. Coast Guard. We have, been recognized re we have been recognized by the National Transportation Safety Board, the U.S. Coast Guard, and the Passenger Vessel Association as an industry leader in maritime safety. When it comes to the city's ambitious and groundbreaking goal of quickly planning and rolling out an interconnected citywide municipal ferry network, DOT has assisted EDC partners in several ways. First, we are providing our maritime expertise. 
Second, Ferry personnel assisted with the RFP design and sat on the selection committee to review bids. Third, we worked together to create an interagency MOU to address operating permits and use of city-owned landing sites. And fourth, as the city street management agency, we developed upland pedestrian and bike, ne bike network connections for each ferry landing where appropriate and installed wayfinding and signage. Finally, we account for the landings in DOT's capital project work and we get data and community input that EDC has received through their outreach process for our bike and other transportation planners to use. In conclusion, we at DOT are glad to see New York City meet a key goal of expanding equitable mobility through the implementation of New York City Ferry, whether adding new transit op options in underserved, often low-income parts of the outer boroughs, or creating more transit on the hard-to-access east side of Manhattan or the Brooklyn Queens waterfront. This historic achievement has probably only been possible in the short and medium term the, through the unique capabilities of EDC, and we are glad to have been and continue to be assisting our partners in this exciting endeavor. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Good afternoon, and thank you to the chairs of the committees and all of the members. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today about Intro 982, the bill to create the Office of the Waterfront. I am Michael Morella, the Director of Waterfront Planning at the Department of City Planning. I've worked at the department for over 14 years, and I've been director for roughly eight of those years. I appreciate the Council's commitment to addressing the very real and pressing issues facing our waterfront. In our five boroughs, we have roughly 520 miles of waterfront, a length greater than the waterfronts of Portland, Oregon, LA in California, and Miami, Florida combined. Our waterfront is one of our greatest assets. It's why we grew as a city and one of the important contributors to the quality of life the city offers today. Intro 982, sponsored by Councilmember Rose, would establish an office responsible for co coordinating among the various agencies that handle matters related to waterfront use. I want to take a moment to thank Councilmember Rose for her continued advocacy on behalf of waterfront issues. We support the intent of this legislation to ensure that the city is doing all that it can to protect and enhance our waterfront and look forward to working with the council toward that end. Allow me to briefly describe the ways in which this work is currently done in my office and with other agencies within the city government. The Waterfront Division of the Department of City Planning plays a vital role in the permitting process for many large projects along our waterfront and waterways. Pursuant to the rules of the City of New York, the Department of City Planning serves as the administrators of the Waterfront Revitalization Program, the City's principal coastal zone management tool. The guiding principle of the program is to maximize the benefits derived from a variety of uses along the waterfront and coordinate the review activities of decisions affecting the coastal zone, particularly when there are overlapping jurisdictions or multiple agencies responsible for elements of the project. The program requires that when a proposed local, state, or federal project or discretionary action is located within the coastal zone, a determination of the activity's consistency with our coastal policies must be made before the action, can move, the action or the project can move forward. As part of our work in administering the Waterfront Revitalization Program, my office is in frequent dialogue with our colleagues at state and federal permitting agencies, namely the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. These two agencies are responsible for reviewing and issuing permits for structures built at the waterfront. As administrator of the Waterfront Revitalization Program, it is my responsibility to liaise with uh, state and federal agencies involved in the waterfront permitting process. Within the past few years, the city has established a website that provides applicants with information on federal and state permitting requirements. My colleagues at the Economic Development Corporation, working with my office and numerous other city and state and federal agencies, established the Waterfront Permit Navigator, a website that provides applicants with information on state and federal permitting requirements. As stated on the very front page of the website, the Navigator is the official permitting guide for projects on or near the city's waterfronts and wetlands. Here you'll find resources to understanding government agencies involved in waterfront permitting, including their permits, programs, and requirements, and get help in navigating the process of, of obtaining permits from start to finish. This website has been a tremendous resource to anyone seeking to file waterfront permits from a community boathouse looking to repair their piers to tugboat operators seeking to replace their bulkheads. Also included in the powers and duties of the proposed office of the waterfront would be to, quote, manage and implement 
the New York City Comprehensive Plan pursuant to Section 205. I would note that Section 205 states that the Department of City Planning shall prepare the Comprehensive Waterfront Plan. My office has already started the, the planning and public outreach for a uh, public engagement process for the next Comprehensive Waterfront Plan due at the end of calendar year 2020, roughly 20 months from now. The legislation also provides that the office would, quote, assist the Waterfront Management Advisory Board established pursuant to Section 1303 in the implementation of duties and responsibilities of such advisory boards. I would note that I currently chair those meetings and have engaged the board in identifying and discussing the issues uh, to be included in the next comprehensive waterfront plan. Coordinating permitting is a, is a critical function as well as the water of the waterfront as so many of so much of our collective vision for the waterfront includes projects that require permits to build the permitting process has improved in recent years thanks to the waterfront permit navigator that i mentioned and the collective efforts of many of my colleagues at city state and federal agencies while permitting remains a challenge we want to work with the council to ensure that the legislation is aligned to help applicants navigate bureaucracy rather than add additional layers I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Intro 982 provides for an important means of amplifying the, the work that my office and many of my colleagues and other agencies do. We look forward to the continued dialogue with the council, and I too am happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, for Let me just uh, give a couple of housekeeping uh, points here to my colleagues. Uh, I'm only going to ask one question so we could get to you quickly, but we have two other chairs here as well, plus the sponsor of the bill, and then we'll do three-minute uh, uh, rounds, and then we'll do a second round, first, second round, as many as it takes, uh, so we could uh, have some momentum uh, taking place. Uh, at this moment, uh, here's my question. At this moment, uh, we're, the ridership is 275. Uh, the mayor recently stated that it costs, that we have to subsidize that. Uh, if I remember right, it was $12 per rider? It's never been 12 per rider. In the first year, uh, when we had a, a number of startup costs, it was north of 10. We see it going down over time and can speak to that. And so, yeah, I would love for you to address at what point do you see that it will pay for itself? Uh -huh. Or is that an attainable goal? Uh, is this sustainable? Uh, are we are, and where do you see the future? Are we going to enlarge the fleet? And by enlarging it, then you have a larger ridership, and therefore uh, the economy of scales will make sense. Sure. Thank you for that question, Mr. Chair. Um, when the mayor charged us uh, with the expansion of East River Ferry to become NYC Ferry, he set forth uh, two priorities and two goals that were his twin North Stars that I think differentiated him from his predecessor. One was the fare structure. Uh, under the previous uh, East River Ferry uh, contract, the fare was $4 on weekdays and went up to 6 on weekends. He felt strongly uh, that for the system to be accessible to people from all walks of life and all backgrounds, we needed to peg it uh, to the $2.75 fare familiar with the Metro card. He also recognized that uh, the most valuable routes and the highest ridership routes were sort of already embodied in the East River Ferry Pilot serving the waterfront and charged us to go further to places like the Rockaways, to Soundview, and now to Coney Island and beyond. Um, all of that comes with a, uh, a dramatic cost, uh, but all in the goal of pursuing transit equity and access for New Yorkers uh, from all backgrounds. That is a cost that we anticipate continuing through uh, the life of the contract in some form or another to be able to make the system uh, uh, work for New Yorkers. On the question of boats, we are presently working to acquire uh, additional boats. We today have 16 in the harbor. We are working to get 22 more. Uh, that will allow us to do two things. It will allow us to serve the already higher ridership uh, than we ever anticipated at the inception of the system, and it will allow for the expansion to the new routes that we announced several months ago that will roll out in 2020 and 21. We project that the aggregate effect of those new routes and the boats and the, and the boats that are able to serve them uh, will be a ridership of up to 11 million people once all of the routes are fully launched. And at that point, do you think that it will pay for itself? Uh, I do not think that it will pay for itself. Uh, we are interested in finding ways to make it 
uh, uh, more financially viable, and we also welcome a conversation broadly on the viability of the system, uh, which Chair Vallone has so helpfully prompted today in the form of Intro 1512. And so how, how, uh, what, What's the lowest, what's, at what point, mm -hmm. I mean, are, are we going to bring it down to $5 that it sure. would cost per ridership, $4? Uh, yeah. What, what would be the lowest? Right. So over the remainder of the term of the existing uh, operating agreement, and uh, we brought a visual aid up on the slide, as ridership expands from its current level to uh, up to the $11 million that we project, uh, and also as the new routes um, uh, come online and come in service with the operating costs associated therewith, we see uh, the subsidy per ride dropping annually through the remainder of the term and settling in at somewhere between 7 to $8 per trip. Uh, have you considered other ways uh, to increase revenues, whether it's to have I don't know, are you selling things? Uh, uh, you have vendors? Sure. Uh, we have um, thought about and looked at advertising and sponsorship revenue. Uh, there are some of those that work. There are some, are some of them that may not. There's a live conversation, as you know right now, about other forms of advertising on New York City's waterways that could have implications here as well. Um, but we have, uh, we have looked at that um, uh, closely. Uh, it's also worth noting that while we are committed at a policy level to locking our fare in step with the MTAs, to the extent that the MTA raises its fare, uh, and that is always obviously a public conversation, mm -hmm. but if it were to happen, $3, whatever it might be, that upside is public upside, not private upside in the subsidy of the system. Gotcha. Thank you so much. Let me turn it over to my colleague, Chair Blum. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. We've been doing, joined by Council Members Yeager, Menchaca, Ku, Mizell, Espinal, Miller, Reynoso, Lander, and Deutsch, uh, and Barron. I know Madam Barron, how are you? At the end. So, what I, I want to just back up a little bit, and James, Rebecca, and everyone, thank you for the testimony. I, I think we wouldn't be here today if we didn't have this successful program in place that gives this alternative option to New Yorkers. Today is about talking about the future of it, expanding of it, where the vision should take us, mm -hmm. uh, how best that should happen. But this is a conversation we've been having, not since I've been chair, and certainly as Speaker Johnson has been purporting. Uh, we want to grow the program, and we've been talking about this for, for a couple of years since it started. So uh, we're continuing that conversation today. It's not, not anything new that we want to see this grow. I think the numbers that you put by going up from $4 million uh, to doubling the, the amount of service that it's reaching and maybe tripling in a couple of years also explains the need for it and the growth for it. Um, these bills today are a natural evolution of that step, is where is the future best held for ferries? So what I'd like to ask you for, for the panel that's there, I mean, in a, in a perfect world, I think we almost should combine EDC, DOT, and planning and having the staff that's been working on it and create a brand new ferry agency, similar to what Councilmember Rose is talking about, to take the, the piggybacking of that work and going forward. But the first step in my eyes was creating a director of that and working with you. What, I, what I'd like to ask is a simple generic question at this point is, where do you see the best future and vision for ferry service after today? Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Uh, finding a sustainable uh, future for New York City Ferry and one in which it can grow, we think is a uh, an important conversation and one we thank you for starting in the form of, of this bill. Um, at EDC, uh, we're very proud of the work that we have done to launch NYC Ferry from the time of the mayor's announcement to 27 months later and having a working and viable system that, that New Yorkers love. Um, but we're also not proprietary or territorial about it in the way that public instrumentalities sometimes are. Uh, we are open to conversations about its finding uh, a new home and a permanent home in whatever place policymakers, be they mayors or the city council, best see fit. Um, our one note on it uh, is an operational one and it is a, a present day one. Um, this is still a brand new system. It is only two years old. Uh, and we are expanding that system over the next two years through 2020 and 2021. And so, uh, to mix metaphors probably badly, it's a little bit like trying to jump on a horse that is in motion to try to find it a new home at the present time. Uh, there is a crew of over 300 people who are working for Hornblower today whose futures would need to be uh, thoroughly sorted out. 
Uh, there is an operating agreement that is currently with EDC that might need to find a new home. There are private agreements with uh, uh, owners of piers and wharves all over the city that, again, today are with EDC. And there are about $300 million in construction contracts that are outstanding for piers, wharves, and boats that we, too, hold. Uh, and so to ensure that there is an orderly transition both for the system and for riders, uh, that is a thing that we think takes uh, a careful approach takes a little bit of time and is probably best addressed after we expand. So the interagency cooperation is already existing now? The interagency cooperation is great. We, so we how do you see the percentage of that lying within the three agencies that are present today? Um, I'm, the, I'm sorry, what was the question? Sir? How do you see the percentage breakdown of who's handling what based on the, sure. the three agencies that are here today? Sure. Um, as concerns the New York City ferry system? Yes. Okay. That's what we're talking about. Right. Uh, NYC ferry specifically. Uh, so we had uh, a very close partnership with DOT, as my colleague uh, indicated in the course of procurement. The deputy commissioner who oversees the Staten Island ferry was on our selection committee and was and remains a key advisor to the system uh, and its waterways. DOT has been a key partner in planning for upland access uh, for many of the piers, be that street connections, city bike stations, uh, and other matters germane to the street grid. Uh, and uh, DOT is also the regulator under the city charter and had to permit the system uh, at the time of launch. And so we view it as a very close partnership, uh, not just now, but through expansion in the same way that it has been. And to the extent that we are looking towards ideas like what is proposed in intro 1512, uh, we think it's absolutely cru crucial and even more crucial that DOT be a, a close partner in the next operator procurement. So then, Rebecca, I guess through DOT's eyes, if we were to create the director of ferry operations under DOT, is that something we could handle at current, or is that something for a future project? I think that would be something for a, a future project, not something for right now, considering the, the services that we're providing just to Staten Island. I think we would, yeah, future. I think well, I'm that. Uh, what my and I think based on the the I guess the years of hearings that we've been going through, it, it's clear the success has not ever been in question. In fact, when we had our Queens delegation together and all the Queens council members that are here, uh, and you led that conversation at the borough presidents, there was one civic group and one community group after another that said, "Please bring it to our community. Please bring it to our community." So it was never somebody calling up saying, "Don't put it in our community." So it, it's a matter of realizing that call from New Yorkers. And, and ramping this project up into the best way possible. And I know President Patchett has spoken before through EDC of the overall burdens that are already on EDC, mm -hmm. that they are already contracted through so many, so many different scenarios. To me, something independent in the creation for the growth of this, I think is critical, mm -hmm. based on, on the projects we didn't get to mm -hmm. already, um, some of the projects that were not handled and were not given contracts to. So. Um, before we, we turn it over to um, Chair Rodriguez, where can we can we look at future options for some assistance in privatization at some of these future locations? Uh, there are certainly areas, and, uh, and obviously we, we speak with Queens at heart, um, where I don't even we don't have subways. Mm -hmm. So for us, having a ferry option is critical. And today, if we're talking about everyone saying let's get vehicles off of Manhattan Street. Well, you got to give us an option to do that. This is one of those options that might actually do that. It's nice to say don't drive, but right. when I don't have a train, I got to find some other way to get into Manhattan. So having a ferry service, maybe at City Field Marina or somewhere in Northeast Queens, would do that. Is there is there a look at maybe privatizing to bring down subsidization costs, subsidizing of the, of the ferries? Yeah. That, thank you, Mr. Chair. We couldn't agree more. Uh, uh, I think two things are true in response to your question about expanding ferry service to additional places. One, uh, we are committed to looking at that and looking at that actively after the launch of the next routes. It is, I think, incumbent upon us uh, to look at what we are currently doing, understand if people are riding it, in what ways, when, and who, to a point that was made. Uh, uh, earlier, uh, and also looking at potential sites for expansion as the city uh, grows and changes in the dynamic way that it always does. Uh, and that relates to the, the second point uh, that I was going to make, which is specific to ferry service. One of the things that is uh, uh, 
very helpful about it for waterfront communities is that on a cost basis, as a, as a startup uh, operation, it is very different than other modes of transit. We all remember the Second Avenue subway, which on a per mile basis, I believe costs $2.5 billion to build. Uh, new ferry routes costs $2.5 million to build in the startup phase, and so we're talking about one-tenth of one percent of the cost of, of a ferry, and it also compares favorably, I'm sorry, of the subway, and it also compares favorably to bus. And so we are interested in that while continuing to look at ridership, the viability of landings, safety, and all of the other questions that go into siting, but, but we are eager to do that and to do that with members like yourself. So the ownership of the boats themselves... Are they all within EDC, or is there still a portion that are privately owned? Uh, we are working to uh, affect public ownership of all of the boats right now. Uh, we uh, uh, came to the determination very early on in the citywide ferry procurement and ensconced it in the contract that it made sense for the city to, uh, to own, that, own those boats uh, from both a fiscal perspective and a future leverage perspective and operator conversations. Uh, that uh, uh, that is the city's plan. It is budgeted for in the capital plan. We uh, have our budget codes from OMB, and we are presently waiting on the city controller to approve that registration. And in the future of those contracts, when would this when would the next RFP be offered to go beyond where we are today? We are we are. Uh, uh, planning to issue the RFP for the next operator, which, as you noted, would come online in 2023, in 2021. Is there any room for expansion under the current contract to add additional ferry service, whether through budget or mm -hmm. capacity? The current contract allows for expansion, much in the same way that we announced the recent expansion. Uh, our plan is, is to look at that question in earnest in 2021 after we get through the current expansion. And with the sites that weren't chosen and for a possible future expansion, uh, would those be able to be equipped with the current operator or would we need to seek additional operators and additional boats? They could be served with the current operator for the remainder of the term of the current operating agreement and with a successor operator during the course of that agreement. Was there ever a uh, possibility that New York State or New York City purchased their own boats or do we have to continue to look beyond New York State? Uh, well, we are purchasing the boats uh, on behalf. Actually, of made and manufactured here, ah, way so that we can keep I that see. keep that jobs here. Got it. Um, uh, so the the scale of the vessel need to create the NYC ferry system uh, at inception was not sort of servable by any boat yard in the harbor. We did look at it, but as an economies of scale question, it became evident to us that we would have to go to boat yards in places where there were other uh, boating needs and other needs for vessel creations that could sort of sustain those as a viable business. And so those turned out principally to be in the Gulf of Mexico and places like Louisiana and Alabama, uh, where there is, uh, depending on how the offshore drilling industry is doing at any time, a robust shipbuilding uh, set of firms. Well, let's hope we can get that back yeah, to folks be, here in New York. That would be tremendous. Uh, thank you for that. I'll save my second for the next round. Chair Rodriguez. And we've also been joined by Council Members Levine and Powers. Thank you, Chairs. And Let's be clear. We don't pretend that you know the ferry will be able to uh, provide the number of ridership that you know that the trams or other and buses provide in the city of New York. It, it, what we know is that we need to add additional motor transportation in our city, especially when we look at transportation deserts in the city of New York. It, Listening to the testimony of on, of the expertise on 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 that DOT has shared with all that you provide, what I see is that you guys are ready to come with the experience that is needed to run the ferry services in our city. I'm sorry, did you just say that we're ready to... Are you ready? Are you, is DOT ready if we create a director of ferry operations to come with the sprint that is necessary? I mean, these are, these, are two these, 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 are two, these are two different systems. We have been running one route for over 100 years. I would think that we would need to have further discussions. I think uh, James did an excellent job in laying out a, a lot of the complexities there in terms of contracting. That would that would need to be figured out. I think it would be an in, in a very complicated 
switch, but I, I think that, I mean, we're here to have that conversation and to also commit to continuing to have that conversation in the future. And I think it's, it's also something that the mayor said as well recently that I didn't think that now in, in the midst of expansion was the time to do that, but it was definitely something that could be looked forward to in the future. Well, for me, the future means moms. So the future for me doesn't mean the new administration. And we have this administration that those of us serving from the mayor and others who will be serving up to 21. So I hope that, that it, 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 in the next few months working with our colleagues and the leadership with the speaker and you guys, we can really get engaged in this conversation and move forward toward creating the director of ferry operations. I always have seen, I think that ADC provide their expertise in their own field. I, from my own uh, way, I see you guys are uh, uh, the private arms of our government. I think that you come with a lot of expertise or, you know, sitting with Cornell Tech and, 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 and dealing with the finance. Mm -hmm. But I think that when it comes to the expertise to make operator accountable to the everyday operation, I don't see DC as a one day agency that should be responsible for that. However, I see DOT as a one that has a lot to do with the everyday responsibility to look at, you know, in our city, New York, transportation, the agency that should, you know, and, and I say, I hope that this is not something that we're looking for the new administration, neither are saying that this is something that should happen in the next few weeks. I know that things, a, a transition like this will take time, but I believe that it, it, it is time for us to look at our ferry, not from a luxury transportation, but for a additional mode of transportation that together with our trains, our buses, our bike, is also adding to New Yorkers. So uh, in that direction, has the, the city start any conversation with the MTA of any possibility to of, of updating the fair payment system so that the city has any discussion and, and, and to establish any fair integration payments? Mm -hmm. We, we have. That is a conversation that is of great interest to us in figuring out if and how it would be possible to ensure seamless integration from the New York City ferry system onto subways and buses. And we have been uh, having that conversation with the MTA on and off for a couple of years, including, I think, as recently as Tuesday. Um, uh, where the MTA is heading on this issue is towards the adoption of a new fare medium. They are moving away from the Metro card, as you probably know, something they call One Metro New York. Uh, that is a, a new system for paying. You may have seen the little screens on some turnstiles and subway stations. Uh, and they have said that they plan to roll that out by 2023 and begin talking to other transit agencies that want to integrate with it in 2021. Obviously, we'd want to have that conversation sooner, uh, and we are pushing for it. Um, but that is their current timeline, and, and that is what we've been given. I think it, it does bear mentioning as we talk about fare integration, and particularly as we talk about the ferry system in a, uh, a prism or a frame of cost, um, uh, which we've already started to do today. Uh, it is our presumption, uh, as with many things involving the MTA and the city, that that integration would not be a, a free lunch for us, that it would cost the city of New York uh, something to be able to achieve it. And the question is whether that is something that will be uh, uh, worth it in the final calculus for the benefit of riders, which we agree is real. And, 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 and again, for many years, we've been having conversation, conversation with, the, with the MTAs, with uh, the city, and, and many other stakeholders to really put that vision in place. It's like when we think about free tuition at CUNY, we should end a vision where it should only be one payment system. But one day we can say in the city of New York, visitors in New York who pay, who pay for one ride, that ride should be allowed to transfer between someone who, who use city bike, mm -hmm. who use the ferry, who use the train, who use the bus. I think that will make a difference and I think that will, will be, it will add, you know, a, the, the, the way of how we provide New Yorkers and, and visitors the opportunity to use all motor transportation only with one payment. Mm -hmm. As usual, Council Member, we couldn't agree with you more. Uh, when we launched NYC Ferry, we set up a fare medium system uh, with the specific goal of making sure that it was flexible enough and open enough to be interoperable with anything that the MTA or anyone else might roll out. Uh, and so that is our, our plan and our intent, and our hope is that we have a, 
a reasonable and willing partner. With, with City Bike, we saw how what well, started with, you know, the previous administration, you went through some challenges, a DOT and the city negotiate with a new one and now live on a carry city bike. But also we have seen how with the new technology, we have seen expansion of city bike, of a share bike. Do you see also that there's going to be a moment or there has been <coughs> any opportunity to bring other uh, beside home blower, other entity in the private sector that will come and say, we also would like to add mm -hmm. additional uh, ferry service? Uh, yes, uh, and that's why when we look at the capital investment that we have made in the city's wharfs, piers, and ferry landings, we view it not just as an asset for the NYC ferry system, but an asset for New Yorkers that creates the possibility that private ferry operators might want to run a route from New Jersey to the west side of Manhattan or to Staten Island or, or wherever it might be. Uh, uh, if they so choose. And so uh, our, our hope is to see that happen. We believe uh, New York City, as the chair said, is a, is a city of water, and that is an exciting opportunity that we're re-exploring, uh, and we hope it will happen. Uh, as concerns competition, which I think is part of what you're asking too, um, we believe that the NYC ferry system itself is best operated as an integrated system, one fare system, one management structure, uh, one group of people making sure that boats connect at docks when they're supposed to and are, are actively and dynamically managing it. But we also uh, thought about the contract term in a particular way, right? The reason it is a six-year contract and not a 30-year contract is for that very reason, the opportunity to create real competition in the continued operation of the system. Last question in this round. If you can share with us one area where the uh, horn, uh, home blower uh, been running the ferry. Which area do you think that provide room to improve? Um, well, we think of horn blower as a as a partner, uh, and so we think of this as a joint enter enterprise between EDC on behalf of the administration and horn blower. If I had to rethink one aspect of the ferry system, uh, I think obviously we underestimated how popular it would be when we planned it, right? We planned for a certain level of ridership. We're looking at a certain order of magnitude beyond that. And so if we had the chance to do it over again uh, ourselves in this partnership, we would have, I think, bought more and larger boats earlier than we did. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Debbie Rose. Thank you, Chair Cabrera. Um, Hi, Michael. It's good to see you. Um, um, in intro 982, uh, it is about establishing a, a separate office of the waterfront. The um, New York waterfront is 520 miles of linear waterfront, and um, there's not one, just one office that has oversight. Between industrial, commercial, and residential and recreation uses on our waterfronts, What's the total number of local, state, and federal agencies that have some regulation or oversight over our waterfronts? There can be upwards of a dozen different agencies that have various levels of responsibility on the waterfront. Um, and uh, that is uh, a, a factor that certainly goes into how we're thinking about our management and our planning for the waterfront uh, going forward. Um, so you raise an excellent point. So um, with multiple city agencies having overlapping jurisdiction um, over the waterfront and the different requirements, how um, do the city agencies coordinate today? How do you coordinate to avoid permitting, you know, waterfront uses or conflicting with each other? So I think there are a few different issues that are that are embedded with that with that question. One is regarding the jurisdiction of the individual properties. And so it is not uncommon that there will be a uh, DOT street street with along the waterfront uh, with a park just outboard of that street and with Department of Environmental Protection pipes running under those. That's a that's a relatively frequent occurrence. Um, and the way that that has been managed over uh, 
over the time is that these agencies have recognized the challenge that there is the need to work together. Um, I think that's probably the simplest way of, in regards to the physical jurisdiction. The question of regulations is a, is a little different insofar as the regulations are not necessarily that of the varying city agencies um, but are much more frequently a factor of state and federal regulations um, when it becomes the in-water permitting for, uh, for construction or reconstruction of things like docks, wharves, uh, bulkheads, etc. And those are the permits that are required by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. So as, um, as an individual citizen, um, walk me through the process. How do I know, um, how, do, how do I know where to go to get my question or my concerns um, regarding the waterfront address, uh, whether it's recreational or business? Um, and how does DCP, DCP, um, do intake and triage these, you know, these communications? Sure. So I think there are a few different, again, there, there are a few different levels at which this operates. So for issues of, regu uh, of recreation, I think most folks would likely contact the Parks Department uh, if it's a question of what can be the use of a waterfront park. I would say, that I think that is how most New Yorkers would uh, would seek to have their questions answered. Um, but if it's a question about where, if let's say you're a waterfront business owner and you're seeking to get waterfront permits for the construction or reconstruction of a dock or a, uh, or a pier, that is something that, that we have been working with the maritime uh, community to provide information through that, that website that I mentioned, the Waterfront Permit Navigator, which walks applicants through the permitting requirements, as well as the list of the various agencies that would, would be involved in a project, uh, in a project's permits. So um, with the Navigator, the Navigator is basically only informational. Um, and um, if I'm a person who sort of really is affiliated with the Waterfront, um, I probably know the basic information that the navigator provides for us. So um, what's in place to help a person, you know, beyond that, someone who has real issues, they know, you know, what the issue is, and the navigator is not, you know, um, wouldn't help facilitate. So am I to assume that in this instance that in the applicant is having a hard time getting their permits uh, from a state or a federal agency? Is yeah, that what you're saying? They need some, some help to actually navigate through the process, not, you know, informational. Right, like how right. To so, begin so, so just in this, in this uh, circumstance, the applicant has submitted their application, has gotten the information that they need through the Waterfront Permit Navigator website, and have submitted their application to the State Department of Environmental Conservation or the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and are, are stuck at that point. I just want to be I just want to clarify that is what you're asking? Yes. Okay. So then then the applicant would have to work with the state and federal agencies. Um, it would be difficult, if not impossible, to conceive of a way in which the Department of City Planning, another regulatory agency, would have the ability to advocate on behalf of a private applicant to a state or a federal regulatory agency. I would say, however, that we do coordinate closely. Uh, with our state and, per and federal agencies. So in my role as the administrator of our waterfront revitalization program, that is precisely the role that I, uh, that I have, is to coordinate amongst these agencies to make certain that rather than having the multiple rounds of review where the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers makes their comments to the applicant, the applicant changes their application to meet those comments, and then re it is reviewed by DEC and those projects, then they make comments and so on and so forth, and it becomes mm -hmm. this daisy it, chain. It, yeah, of, it becomes quite circuitous that's that's, and that's, that's exactly the type of sort of structural issues that my office tries to resolve by working directly with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and with DEC. We have monthly meetings with DEC about projects. We have a a list of projects that we go through every month with an agenda to discuss in detail the status of those projects and to understand what issues are remaining. I would say that it's not the same as advocacy on behalf of a private applicant, though. That is a, that's a distinction. Um, with 12 different agencies that impact our waterfront and decisions made uh, about the waterfront, um, 
how does the person, you know, figure out which one? And does DCP have a public-facing office that relates solely um, to waterfronts? and um, issues of the waterfront? So I would say that, that my office is quite publicly facing. If you were to call 311, and, uh, and folks from the public often do, uh, <coughs> they get to, they get routed to my office, if de depending on the nature of the question. Um, if it's a question, again, about a parks department site, that question would be routed to the parks department. But for many general inquiries, it is routed to my office, yes. Can I just one more question? Um, uh, what mayoral agency would you suggest um, the Office of Waterfront be uh, housed or be affiliated with? Since the mission is very broad based, it's not a function just of land use. Um, and uh, I'm really looking for a place where there would be oversight, advocacy, as well as coordination and management. As, as described in the bill, uh, I would say the vast majority, if not all, all but one of the responsibilities listed out in the bill, are responsibilities that my office at the Department of City Planning already have a significant role in, if not directly oversee. So I would suggest the Department of City Planning is the appropriate entity. I, I would like to see it not buried in as sort of an addendum to something that you're already doing um, and, you know, extra staff or a change in title. I'm talking about a freestanding office that would handle a broad base number. Uh, happy of to continue issues. that conversation. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we join with Councilmember Rose that we tread lightly on creating, and we want to make this a better system, not a more cumbersome system. So, uh, even the Director of Ferry Operations is something that could work with Councilmember Rose and with your office. But I think it's clear that. The growth of this requires probably its own agency, but until we get to that point, we need to to continue this conversation immediately to get to the next phase. So we've been joined by Council Member Carlina Rivera and the next Council Member for questions. Um, we have five panels, it's just so as a public notice uh, for everyone, we have five panels, so we're going to keep to three minutes. So the next Council Member is Carlos Machar. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you all for presenting today. The waterfront is incredibly important to, to me and the district that I represent, Sunset Park and Red Hook. And, and really the question I have is for both DCP and EDC. Uh, one, to tell us a little bit about how, how you currently work together. Uh, I'm thinking about one of the first things that got me excited about the waterfront in terms of my role. And uh, four letters, S, B, M, T. Uh, James, I know you and I were in a room, uh, very passionate uh, conversations have, and Lydia was there as well. Um, I'll never forget that because that, that really reminded me about how, how important our role was at the city council level. Uh, we had a very specific role because SBS was involved too. SBS holds many of the leases and EDC wanted the mass release and we said, whoa, wait up, let's talk about this. And, and we made something beautiful. Now we have Red Hook ter Terminal coming in. My point is, is that uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a great move here that we're trying to understand to create a space for advocacy. Where does EDC and how does EDC think it's, of itself as an advocate and reconcile that with DCP, who is the first time I even got to know, I don't even know you, I don't, I've been working on the waterfront stuff for a long time, and, and you're holding so many of these responsibilities. So there, there's clearly a disconnect here, and the only time that I feel like we're doing something well is when we work together, and I think that's what we're trying to do is bring more light, more transparency, more responsibility, more accountability, because the reason we even got to SBMT was that was a failed mission from the EDC. And I'm not saying anybody that was involved here w or was involved here, but previous versions of the EDC just got that wrong. And we almost lost that property. So we can't do that. It's very important to us, the waterfront. Right. Help us understand. Sure. How are you advocates? How do you work together? And, and that really from both of your perspectives. Sure. Uh, I, Mike, do you mind if I start Thank and then I'll, I'll hand it off? Um, uh, at EDC, we've historically seen ourselves uh, both as advocates for the waterfront and as stewards for many of the city's waterfront assets. And under our maritime contract with the city of New York, dating back to the dissolution of the 
Department of Ports and Terminals and beyond, uh, we have been entrusted on behalf of the city and through SBS with the uh, repair and maintenance uh, of those facilities and uh, and to a degree with, uh, with creating visions for their future. And I agree with you fully, Council Member, that that is a process that works better when it is a collaborative one with communities and the Council, and that is a, I think, a, a thing that has come to be learned, and that is a successful outcome of several processes, including the, the SBMT process. Um, we also consider ourselves advocates for the city's waterfront assets. Um, uh, for us, uh, we focus on ferries, we focus on ridership, we focus on site selection for uh, waterfront properties, uh, and we involve ourselves in real estate dispositions. Whereas, you don't have a timer, by the yeah. way. You can keep talking. Oh, great. Whereas city planning focuses on zoning, the development of waterfront guidelines, and the like. But I think your point is a good one, that the waterfront is a complicated uh, space that is increasingly of interest to many different kinds of people, whether they be industrial like SBMT or recreational boaters or crews or development or, what el or whatever it might be. And so um, we, like our colleagues at City Planning, are equally excited by Councilmember Rose's bill because the notion of a coordinating function across those diverse interests and across those city agencies and instrumentalities we think is uh, an important one whose time has come. So I would just add that, that a few of the different ways in which we collaborate with EDC on waterfront projects uh, and broadly on waterfront coordination uh, is that the role that the Waterfront Management Advisory Board plays. So that's a board made up of, mem of members of the public appointed by both the speaker and the mayor. Uh, and we are now meeting regularly. It's meetings that I chair. But at the very first of these meetings that we reconvened just last year, uh, EDC is represented on, these, on the board. And uh, President Patchett was, attended the very first meeting. Since that time, we've had uh, staff level attend senior staff level attendance because we're really getting into the the, the meat of these issues, um, but it's but it is exactly that type of relationship that is incredibly important um, to to continue. The other important aspect of this is this, the role of the city's comprehensive waterfront plan, and the interagency team that is working with my office to to begin the planning and the public outreach process for that. Recognize that the plan comes out in about 20 months from now, and it's good to meet you, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember Chuck. And now we're going to have Councilmember Antonio Reynoso. Oh, and SPMT stands for South Brooklyn Marine Terminal. Google it. We're a city of acronyms. <laughs> we love our uh, Councilmember Reynoso. So uh, I hope you guys can be short in your answers so I can ask more questions. Um, so uh, the first thing I want to say is uh, equity. Uh, do we have demographic information about who's taking the ferry and who's, and who's not or uh, where are your highest uh, ridership mm -hmm. is? Do we have that information? We, we, we have some of that information. We okay. have twice uh, surveyed our ferry ridership since we launched the system. We know that 83% uh, of the riders are New York City residents and that rises to 88% at... I'm more, I'm, more, I'm more focused on the ridership within the city of New York. Sure. They tend to be in waterfront areas and waterfront areas in the city of New York tend to be where uh, more affluent people live. Yep. And um, what I want to do is make sure that we're talking about how we're spending money, a significant subsidy, um, and who is receiving that. Right. Uh, the ridership within the MTA uh, and in the city bike system is a lot more what I consider equitable and speaks to a large range of, uh, uh, of, of uh, I guess, uh, uh, incomes. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to know that information for the ferry. Sure. Do, do you have that information? Uh, we don't have information on who precisely is riding the boats today, but I can say that we made our siting decisions very oh. specifically with an equity lens in mind, okay. uh, particularly when we talk about expanding to places like uh, to St. George, to the Rockaways, to Corlears Hook on the Lower East Side, and beyond where we see median family incomes in the range of thirty to thirty-five thousand dollars a year. Um, that was purposeful and that was intentional and, and with a goal of expanding the New York City ferry system beyond the Michael Bloomberg model of just that core East River corridor that yes, I think and you're so referring and, to. Right. And most yeah. of your ridership is going towards the what we would consider either the central business district or the financial district, right? Uh, most of our ridership, much of our ridership, particularly during the commute hours, overwhelmingly is people commuting to work in, in the Manhattan core or lower Manhattan. Right, and those, those folks that are probably commuting to the financial district probably have decent, uh, decent pay, I guess. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know that we 
know that to be true. Uh, I guess All right, that's, so that's pretty about. much the point. Um, can we get that information so that we can have a serious discussion about where we're prioritizing the subsidies that the city is giving the, uh, related to transportation? Um, $600 million is a significant amount of money um, that could be uh, targeted uh, in locations or transportation options that are more equitable. Uh, city Bike right now doesn't receive any subsidy from the city outside of the spaces it uses uh, to put their docking stations. Um, and they cover millions of more people than the ferry service. Uh, and they're, again, not receiving any subsidies. And the subsidies that we're giving to the MTA system per customer, uh, this you know pales in comparison to what we're giving to the ferry system. So even though I do think it's valuable and we want to build it out more robustly, we need to have a conversation about where our money is going. And I don't think you have the information to give me right now uh, one, I think that's a problem. But two is why I get concerned if we move things from DOT to EDC. Uh, DOT is a city agency, and the amount of oversight we have over them is significant. Um, with EDC being a public-private a public -private, um, uh, agency, I guess, uh, it, it could mean that you guys give us a hard time about getting us information like that. So I uh, just want to make that more of a statement than a question, but uh, getting demographic information would be extremely valuable for for my advocacy for uh, expanded ferry service. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, we are going to go to Council Member Miller, but before we do that, um, you know, we agree to disagree. There are many communities that are not biking to New York City, so we have to provide alternative options for everyone in the city. So uh, until we get to that day where everyone can equally get where they need to go, we have to provide as many options as possible. So I will continue to advocate for ferry service for everywhere throughout the city uh, to make sure that we can continue that option, especially for communities like mine that are not biking and have no trains. So with that, I'd like to go to Councilman Miller. Thank you, Chair Vallone. And uh, I want to thank my colleague for actually uh, introducing that line of questioning um, around the area of equity, not only around the area of equity, but um, whether or not we as a body are living up to our, our fiduciary responsibility to make sure that we are delivering services in the most equitable way. Um, my question um, from my transportation planning background would be, um, had we done a, a comprehensive study to make sure that we are able to deliver services to move people to and from in a more efficient way than the investment in ferry? Um, and I do want to say that we, we, we and, and I want you to jump right in, but um, we seem to dismiss the amount of, of subsidy that is going into this. $10.50, $12 uh, greatly exceeds anything that we see now in terms of even um, the commuter rails that happened, and, and they uh, also um, service far less New Yorkers, so we want to make sure that we're delivering it uh, equitably, whether or not um, this could have been done with select bus service, uh, considering that we are servicing that, that uh, waterfront corridor, um, and, and certainly that could have been done cheaper. So my primary question, number one, is have we explored other methods of delivering these services? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll DOT. Oh. I mean, we're, we're – have. Thank you very much. That's a, that's a great question. Is I just want to make sure I'm understanding it. Are you saying have we explored how to duplicate what what EDC is doing? With no. Other have you explored how are you going to move these people into the business district? Uh, alternatives outside of ferry. I mean, we're we are uh, we're constantly working with the MTA in terms of expanding uh, bus dedicated bus services throughout the city. Um, and we just announced uh, this past winter an expansion of, of City Bike. Have you looked at bus, uh, select bus service on this particular route here? Because 62 and 69 does almost essentially the same thing, and, and certainly the cost would be more cost effective in this end. And then I further want to say for EDC, the, 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 uh, one of the cheers is uh, whether or not at what point um, – would this program pay for itself? I would ask to reverse and ask, at what point would this become cost prohibitive? If, in fact, all the narratives that was introduced today didn't play itself out. And for the record, I do dismiss also that, that we are serving underserved communities, that there's certainly the Bayside College points of the world as well um, that don't have transportation uh, alternatives. 
but is this the most efficient transportation alternative um, that we see in the best use of our city dollars? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think stepping back, it is um, fair to acknowledge, and I, I think most members would agree, that we do have a transportation crisis in New York City today. People need to get uh, to work and to home uh, efficiently and as quickly as possible, and the subway and the bus systems have not um, uh, served as well as they used to or as people might like. I had that issue on my commute this morning, and I think it's incumbent upon the city uh, to use all of the tools at its disposal to uh, serve different places with different modes of transportation as appropriate. In waterfront communities, many of them have historically been left behind and left out of transit access, and some of them have been cut off by structures that um, urban planners of the days of yore have uh, sought to erect. They cut them off from traditional means of transit. And so ferries become uh, not only a logical way, but in some cases the only way to serve those communities uh, reliably. Uh, in terms of uh, the opportunity agenda, which was a, an issue you raised in your comment, we have looked uh, to the greatest extent possible to extend to those waterfront communities with real need, be that in Sunset Park, be that in Rockaway, uh, be that in South Williamsburg uh, or Coney Island or the North Shore of Staten Island. Um, so our priority remains a broad-based service that serves So I'm, I'm sorry, because I know time is yeah. limited. I don't want to cut you off, but I, I, again, I dismiss that the Rockaways, uh, you're looking at not far Rockaway um, to those those lower incomes and others and, and and quite frankly it's also been an afterthought and when we looked at where it was actually rolled out whether it was rolled out in the more affluent emerging waterfront communities which already had transportation options but my primary question was mm -hmm. did we do a comprehensive study as to whether or not we could deliver these services move these folks in a more efficient effective fashion and then finally we're talking about collaborations with the MTA. Are we doing this because it is a mode of transportation that the, MTA, that the New York City can control without going through the MTA or the governor? Um, why don't you talk about the alternatives analysis? We have now done three citywide ferry studies, all of which looked at the alternatives to ferry service with respect to the routes that they serve. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so if you could introduce you yourself for the record. Pardon me. Uh, my name is James Wong, director of ferries for NYC for EEC. Um, and in the past, our, comprehen our comprehensive citywide studies have looked at all of the sites around the city where we are looking to provide transit alternatives. And it takes a lens of understanding where people live, where they work, what their existing transit options are, and whether or not ferries would, in those circumstances, provide a, a tangible uh, transit time savings to allow people more time to spend with families at home outside of the outside of their commute. Um, we didn't do an exact one-to-one -to, -one to understand whether or not a subway would do the same job, but I do want to just point back briefly to what we were talking about earlier on some of the capital costs that are the real differentiators between some of the major uh, major select capital costs. Sure. Yes. Talk about building out subways. Talk about select bus. Sure, and even with select bus projects, um, there are uh, high price tags allocated with them with having to make changes to streets um, and having to do things like that. It still comes out in, in many cases that ferry systems, because there is only infrastructure at the landings, that those are some of the areas where we're able to um, really make those investments. But there were also infrastructure investments made as well, right? To which, to, I'm sorry? To, to ferry service in order for the landing. Yes, yes and, absolutely. and what you're showing here yeah. is an all-in cost yeah. for infrastructure and boats, right? Yes. For, yes. So why don't you do compared to select yes. bus service using the this, Woodhaven SBS line? Sure. Uh, and so the comparative costs for all for the bus lanes, for all the associated upgrades that came through uh, the project for the Woodhaven SBS compared to NYC Ferry, which the costs are the landings. Sorry, just to clarify, this is separate from rolling stock or vessels. Uh, that the, all of the landings divided by our miles that we are serving, that these are the relative costs that we're looking at, less than 10% of the SBS costs. The projected Woodhaven um, SBS, because what was actually done was they painted lines, they didn't do the actual infrastructure. So what we're looking at or the projection, what could have been as opposed to what actually was done on Woodhaven Boulevard. I will, I will get back to you to make sure that it's the, yeah, the right number we're talking yeah, about. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Councilmember Dutch, followed by Councilmember Barron and Councilmember Rivera. So 
Uh, thank you. Um, so my first question is, um, what is the cost of manufacturing a ferry? And what, at what uh, price does the city uh, purchase the ferry? That's number one. Number two is that uh, you mentioned about uh, public uh, uh, ownership in the future. So how would you transfer that uh, to the public ownership and at what cost? Mm -hmm. um, so that's number two. Number three is that um, you have uh, weekdays. I see in southern Brooklyn the hours of operation are from 10, uh, 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. and weekend is 6.30 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. What would happen if a private charter attempts to rent the dock for loaning and unloading purposes? Um, would you rent it, or um, are you going to? Do you have a plan in the future to rent those docks? Because, as you know, um, um, when there's a people who rent them, you know, in certain areas in the district, you know, there was a lot of controversy about certain areas, especially in my district, where we had like uh, like nine boats docking. Um, with thousands of people, so I just want to know that in these areas, if um, you are you are planning on renting those docks to private ownerships, and uh, I think that's it. Okay, uh, let me see if I can get to all three in the allotted time. Um, you have yeah, I only have three minutes. Okay, I'll still try to be pithy. Um, uh, so the cost to build ferry vessels, I think, was your first question. Um, this is uh, a number that comes with a certain range because of uh, a variety of factors, including how busy shipyards are with other business, uh, weather conditions like hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico that may diminish supply at shipyards for various reasons, the costs of things like steel and aluminum, which is a global issue and subject to tariffs and federal policy and the like. But the pricing that we have secured on our 150 passenger boats ranges from four to six million dollars uh, per vessel. Uh, and our 350 passenger boats tends to range from seven to nine million per vessel. Uh, the cost for the city to buy those boats from our private operator is effectively that same amount, less any depreciation in the asset, which is very small because they're only about two years old uh, in the case of some of the vessels since they have been uh, purchased by the operator. Now, what is the manufacturing cost? That, that is the cost. So you said, you said uh, 150 passengers, four to six million. Uh -huh. Is that the purchase price? That is the purchase price. So what do, you, what do you buy from? You buy from a manufacturer or from, is there a middle person? Sure. Go ahead. Sure. Um, the prices that we have are negotiated with our operator who goes through an extensive procurement process to make sure that they are getting the best pricing at any given time for, as uh, James had mentioned, uh, the shipyard availability and things like that. The key components are uh, some of it is shipyard price, some of it is equipment provided by the uh, operator, so owner furnished equipment, um, and then of course a, man a, a program cost or a management by the operator. So those are the three key components. Um, I don't have the exact breakdown in front of me, but those are the three principal uh, parts of a vessel pricing. I also just want to mention that as part of our agreement with the operator, um, even these are very complex projects, these vessels, and to build as many of them as we did were extremely, uh, it was a very complex project. And one of the things we did was uh, ensure that the operator takes on the risk, the price risk for these, uh, by making sure that we had set what those outside prices were. So we think that that's an important way that we are shedding risk and making sure that the city is paying the right price. Mm -hmm. There was a third question on docking permits. Do you want yeah. to speak about Dock NYC? Sure. Um, through, well, Dock NYC uh, does go through an exercise in certainly trying to activate the waterfront. We are certainly very uh, sensitive and aware of uh, different issues that have come up related to uh, different kinds of vessels that are berthing um, throughout the city. Um, as it relates to the NYC ferry landings, um, we are welcoming of other uh, commuter ferries or passenger ferries that are taking people to work or having serving uh, important functions there. And so when people have reached out to us to ask whether or not they can do things like providing service to Ikea or providing service uh, for NYU Langone, which is a connection between Sunset Park and uh, Midtown East, uh, that we are willing to allow those. Is this uh, during hours of operation or off hours? Those principally operate during the weekdays, uh, during regular. Uh, regular hours. So how does, how does that, um, th that wouldn't interfere with the service because you have a schedule? 
right? So how would how would that not interfere with the schedule? Of the we ferry? coordinate closely with all of the operators in the harbor, both at our terminals and at these landings that uh, where we might have an, an additional operator to make sure that uh, the timing, the landing slots, or a time at these landings are not. Conflicted. What is the um, the, uh, the minute? How, how many minutes apart does the ferry um, come in during the the weekend, uh, the week, the weekdays? Um, it varies by landing and approximately frequency um, on weekends in this uh, it might be anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes for uh, for an individual and weekdays uh, uh, week on days. weekdays our highest frequency is 20 minutes on the East River uh, per direction so 20 minutes um, in between so that those 20 minutes would be enough for someone to come in and to unload uh, yeah. equipment or something Yes, we go through an extensive process before we offer anyone a landing slot license to make sure that whatever schedules are presented are not going to be uh, conflicting and make sure certainly that from a safety perspective, we've provided ample time in between different uh, different arrivals. Is uh, those, uh, let's say, uh, South, Southern Brooklyn uh, dock, is that currently like being rented out now? Or do you have any one renting it out now, like you, you, you for mean private the, use? the landing at Brooklyn Army yeah. Terminal in South Brooklyn? Yeah. Uh, there are other users beyond NYC Ferry that use that landing, as James mentioned, NYU Lango. Is that public? Is that public uh, record? Is that yeah? Yes, it's public. So we could see it online, if it's someone rents out. There's a live chart online, but if you were, if you wanted to know who uses that landing uh, through Doc NYC, we could easily provide that information. So can you? So you would have it online. You could you could provide it online. We could provide it by email. Uh, we Only don't by have email. It on a website right now. So okay, got it. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Councilmember Baring, followed by Councilmember Rivera. Uh, thank you to the chairs, and thank you to the panel for coming to share your information. I also share the concern of some of my colleagues about having the position of Director of Ferry Operations in a quasi-governmental body namely uh, EDC. When it's in an agency that the city controls, the city can demand and get what it wants. I was a little disappointed uh, when uh, I believe it was uh, Ms. Zach who expressed some kind of reticence about being the agency that would house that. So is that is that accurate? You don't want to do it. You don't think you have the capacity. You don't think you can develop the capacity by such time as it might become operational? I, I think it just deserves a much larger conversation than right now, and we're absolutely willing to keep doing that. So you do think that you could grow to perhaps be the body that might be able to house that person? I think we're an incredible agency and that we're able to accomplish a lot. I think we need to have more conversations internally to see how we could do that. But I think, you know, as you all see, we've, we've been able to accomplish a lot together the past five years. and and we'd be open to having that conversation moving forward. Thank you. And I'm also very much uh, uh, embellishing or uh, supplementing the concerns of my colleagues about equity and where these ferries are going and where they're landing and how it benefits any of the groups that are here in, in Brooklyn and in the five boroughs, Manhattan, Queens, Staten Island, and all of the Bronx, all of those areas, so that everyone gets to share in this great, great subsidy that's being invested in this ferry program. So I really am very concerned about that as well. And finally, uh, are any of your agencies working with the state in terms of the governor's plan to develop the uh, Belt Parkway between, I think it's um, Louisiana to Fountain Avenue, which is in my district, where he's going to have a passive walkway. It's not going to be any kind of major infrastructure that's going to take place, but they will have a kayak port at one end of this near, I believe, Fountain Avenue. Are any of you working with that? With Are the you governor? referring to the to the uh, the reuse of the former landfill sites? Correct. So uh, my office has has some level of involvement through our role in the waterfront revitalization program. So as that project gets further developed, we will have a more of a role in the, the review of that project. Uh, and but, but thus far, it's been very preliminary, just to a essentially a heads up from the from the state about this project. Okay. But we haven't seen any drawings or anything of that nature as of yet. And and finally. Um, are you familiar with Betts Creek, which is parallel to where um, 
the Fountain Avenue landfill is. Betts Creek was parkland that was unlawfully taken and which the courts have determined must be returned to Parks Department. So I don't know if you're familiar with that as well, but uh, here again, the state is going to have its engineers come back and determine how, in fact, that property will be returned to parks and how it will be able to be accessed and what actually will be um, an opportunity for access to waterfront as well. So I would invite you to to uh, look into that as well so that you can see how we can maximize the opportunity for persons who live there to be able to uh, access the water. And in terms of, I did say one question, but one more question. There is a peer, um, I I'm forgetting the name, that was utilized in the 1960s. It's in the Canarsie section of Brooklyn, and there were opportunities for boating and, uh, and other water access at that time. How can we determine the feasibility of having that as a ferry location? What's the process to do an examination to see if, in fact, that area can be established as a ferry point? Uh, I'll just speak generally, and then you can speak to whether we have looked at it specifically. I think the, the questions start with safety. Uh, can a boat be brought to a particular place uh, uh, safely and efficiently uh, and through navigable channels? Uh, and then questions of viability on whether a landing can be constructed. Uh, in some places, including uh, in the pier at Canarsie, uh, they are owned by people who are not the city of New York. Mm. Uh, in this case, I think it's the federal government uh, within the, the Gateway Preserve. Uh, and so there would need to be federal interest or will in taking a commuter vessel there. And then finally, we look at the transit benefits of starting a system. Is it um, faster and more efficient than other modes of transit? Can you get to the place where most people are going, whether that's Lower Manhattan or Midtown for jobs, or the Brooklyn Navy Yard or Army Terminal uh, for manufacturing jobs in a manner that is faster than traditional transit? If you want to add anything to that. Um, no, just to say that uh, I do know that the Canarsie Landing uh, mm -hmm. here that is existing right. today uh, was studied as part of the 2018-19 um, ferry expansion feasibility study, but of course, as James had mentioned, following the launch of the routes in 2020 and 2021, um, I think we'd be more than happy to take a look again um, at different locations throughout the city uh, to evaluate whether or not uh, ferries are feasible there. Okay. Uh, there's very, it's a transit desert at that end of Canarsie. It's not my district, but uh, it's my neighboring district, so I'm very concerned. People could have accessibility to get to the Canarsie Pier if, in fact, that was uh, considered. Thank you to the chairs. Thank you. Council Member Rivera for questions. Hi, how's it going? Hi. Thanks for being here. So, uh, yeah, a lot of my colleagues have brought up uh, equity and transportation, and I think a lot of us like to call transportation the great equalizer. So we, we brought up how the waterfront um, is typically associated with very affluent communities, and I agree, that's absolutely correct, especially with what's going on in the city and development in neighborhoods like my own in Long Island City. Um, but I do have 10,000 families that live in public housing along the East River who I thought could stand to benefit from something like the Corlears Hook Ferry. Mm -hmm. So the last survey you did was in 2017. And from what we heard, you, you didn't quite capture where people lived, correct? So you don't know if ferry users live in public housing, is that correct? Um, we know that ferry users, one, are predominantly from New York, and two, we know that there are uh, up to 50,000 NYCHA residents within a half mile of a landing, including in places like Corlears Hook. But we still need to uh, look more deeply onto who is actually riding the boats. So sometimes when, when something new comes in that you're unfamiliar with, um, you know, people aren't necessarily gravitating towards it. And so in my community, I'm a very able-bodied person and it takes me 15 minutes to walk to the closest train station. So a, a ferry could be nice, but from what I heard um, from, from someone at your agency, the Corlears Hook wasn't performing as well as they had expected. Do you know if that's true? Do you measure ridership and performance of each of the routes and if you do or do not how often do you go back and revisit whether it was worth it mm -hmm. 
So we will um, do a thorough analysis of the current NYC ferry system with an eye towards expansion in 2021. We have committed to that publicly. Um, it, it is, I think, correct to say that Corlier's hook uh, is not the best performing landing in the system. We are curious to find out um, why that is, what the obstacles are to people uh, using the ferry system, and determining if there are ways to eliminate those obstacles. Uh, and welcome your partnership on that. Yeah, and, and in addition, um, I do just want to note, Lower East Side did launch towards the end of uh, the warm season last year, and so we do know that as part of this summer, we continue to engage with community groups. Uh, we have a great partner with our operator who is uh, doing a good job getting trying to get the word out, and as James mentioned, welcome your partnership wherever possible. Um, but it is important to us, certainly, as we start to approach the summer season, that we are able to re-engage with people and make sure that people know, um, because that's just typically when uh, when we want to get there, uh, that people know that the system is available to them. So when will you go back and kind of measure whether the line is performing well, whether you have to do outreach, whether there's some sort of awareness campaign that has to be implemented? Do you, uh, do you have any a policy that you implement? Like every six months we look at numbers, every year. We look at uh, we look at numbers almost every day um, in terms of the ridership. So we are aware that it, as you had mentioned, is uh, has lower ridership. I don't want to say underperforming. I will say it has lower ridership than some of the other uh, other landings. But it is something we are aware of. And as I, as we had mentioned, I think mm -hmm. we're more than happy to uh, engage to find out what the next best step is to do yeah. that engagement. But just to just to answer that question as specifically as I can. Uh, our intent is to look at the current system in 2021 and see what's working and what needs to change, but that doesn't mean that we are precluded from looking at whether people know enough about the landing, how to use it, how to access the service, uh, uh, and any barriers to their doing that. We could do that right now and, and would be interested in doing it with you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, do you have any plans to come to the west side of the Bronx? Uh, do you want to speak to that analysis from the sure from the um, yeah. through the uh, through the different citywide ferry studies that we've done? One of the more challenging areas that we've found on the uh, on the key things that I mentioned earlier in terms of where people live and work and what their existing transit alternatives are, it is often very difficult uh, for ferries to compete with existing modes of transit on uh, when you get to places that are right next to or where you have to go past um, train stations or subway stations. And so a lot of the challenges that we have found previously exist there. However, again, that has not, uh, that is not to preclude uh, any sites from study in the future. But do you have any plans? We don't presently have you plans. You don't have any plans. The and the reason that I'm hearing is because competition, right? With well, their most modes of transportation. Uh, I just want to chime in on, on that thought, which is, uh, you know, the west side of the Bronx, we have, uh, we have a very concentrated area of population where 50% minimal of the people who live there do not own a car, a vehicle. Uh, I, I, I will see, you know, it's within the context that I see in my district, I will see that people would prefer taking uh, the ferry. Uh, maybe, uh, have you conducted any surveys uh, in the areas where you see a challenge? Uh, because we're assuming, right? We're making assumptions as to what the riders would do have you done any surveys uh, in that side of the Bronx to see if this is something that they will be, you know, interested or they have an appetite? Yeah. Uh, we've not surveyed. I mean, when we looked at the most recent round of expansion, uh, as Chair Ballone indicated, we went out to communities and had uh, uh, all, all manner of folks suggest sites they might have interest in seeing for ferry landings. We got over 3,500 suggestions uh, and then analyzed those for feasibility. I think we would have to go back to see uh, how many of the Bronx recommendations were with respect to the Western Bronx. I know we had some suggestions around City Island and certainly around Th and around Throg's Neck where we were ultimately going. Um, but we would have to take another look at the Western Bronx and we can do that. You know, the interesting thing about the worst west part of the Bronx is that my, my district connects with uh, Councilmember Rodriguez district. So it's not just 
people from the Bronx, literally you could just walk uh, the bridge right there off of Fordham. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether it's in his side, my side, I don't think it makes a difference. Uh, that, and as a matter of fact, they used to be right next to the rezoning area, which you just had to rezone. I see that there used to be some kind of uh, a landing area mm -hmm. for, for boats. Uh, that both of those communities, both the Bronx and, so I would think that you will have a critical mass mm -hmm. there uh, that will be very interested uh, in having the ferry. By the way, uh, everything we're mentioning here is, is a good thing. I mean, we want more. Uh, it's because there has been a level of success here that we're interested in, and I agree with you. Uh, the great thing about water is that you don't have to build anything upon it. You don't have to maintain it. Uh, mm -hmm. You don't have to replace anything other than, obviously, uh, and I don't know what's the lifespan of these boats that we're buying. What are they, 20, 30 years? Uh, 20, 30 years, but they can be upgraded and retrofitted to get even more useful life. I think there are ferries trawling the harbor right now. They're probably 70 years old or more. Okay. But please consider the west side of the Bronx. We have this uh, idea in the Bronx that we're usually the last ones to get something uh, offered to us. So we, we, we always working on the suspicion, why don't we have it? And everybody else is getting it. Uh, and so uh, hopefully uh, we could have the meeting of the minds. I'm gonna turn it over now to council member and chair Rodriguez. Thank you, chair. In, in the 2017 survey, did the survey ask any question about the income of, of those individuals? Uh, no, it did not. Sorry. Have you thought about? Uh, uh, in general, for travel surveys where we are generally asking to understand how people are moving about, uh, it has not been our common practice to be asking about people's income uh, status in those. Do you know if there's any, have any plan being made or any discounts has been offered for low income riders? Uh, we presently offer uh, half-price fares for uh, seniors and New Yorkers with disabilities on a monthly pass, and we are um, open and interested to looking at, at other discount structures as well. Have you had any conversation with the administration to also include fare share as part of the payment for using the ferry? Uh, the fair fares conversation has not yet come to the ferries. I know it has been uh, a live one and, and one that has been successfully pursued between the council and the administration elsewhere, and we are, are open to having that conversation as well. How many years has a, a horn blow, blower running the NYC ferry? Sure. Uh, we launched in uh, 2016. 20, sorry, we announced this. Launched in 2017, so we are just coming up on the two-year mark. Okay. And any, what is the profit that they've been able to make in the yearly, um, the last you speak two years? Yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, so just broadly speaking, I do want to mention that um, one of the things that we did is to make sure that the city is not going to be um, exposed to a lot of upside risk in this project and making sure that we fix our payments. And so a lot of a portion of um, horn blowers or of the operators uh, payments to cover their costs are in fact related to things that are risky like uh, ridership revenue and uh, and advertising or concessions, things like that. Um, and these are things that they are uh, entitled to above what we get in order to cover their costs. Um, I don't have an exact number on profit for them. Uh, for Did they share that information with you? We get financial information from them annually and I believe on a quarterly basis as well. So any idea on how they've been doing it? Because at least we share that idea with City Bank and other of those that they DOT it, 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 it provide the franchise and negotiate it. So we don't have that information with you here that you can show us? We, we, we don't have it here. We do have some and, and are happy to come back to you. I think just to elucidate a point my colleague made, uh, the way the operator agreement is structured and similarly the way the vessel purchases are structured is that um, Hornblower gets to keep some amount of upside if the 
system performs really well, uh, but if we don't meet our ridership projections and are less than the four to five million we had originally anticipated, they continue having to operate the system at a loss. Similarly, with the vessel construction, which they have taken on on our behalf in a capacity that's sort of like a construction manager or a GC, we have a guaranteed fixed price on the boats. If they exceed that price because commodities like steel or aluminum uh, rise or the shipyards see a, a spike in cost, we still get our price. Uh, and so there is um, both incentive and risk for both parties running in both directions. Yeah. Look, I, I, I just feel that, in a, in a side say, I 100% I support how the city, you know, made a decision to invest on expanding ferry and also to see how the entity who is running, you know, they've been playing the role. Of course, many questions about safety and other things that happened in the past, but I feel that they also acted properly to correct it, any issue related to safety. It, I think that in you know, making these things a little bit local, as you know, we as part of this rezoning, we've been able to give $15 million, $70 million, to build and to expand it in the, the a new deck in the marina area, in the inward area. And I feel that, it, it, I hope again that and, and that we, looking as, not as a ferry being a luxury mode of transportation, but adding to what we have so far, mm -hmm. have to look at not only to come out with those uh, analysis on a, uh, justifying certain areas that are priority for us mm -hmm. and not thinking about the need that the community have. Mm -hmm. So I think that when we've been dealing in, in even our own community, looking at, you know, can uh, Inwood or the area being expanded as one of those pilot projects that also it is included in the, in the uh, whatever negotiation you guys made uh, with, the, with the home blower that they also they don't have to limit it on what they have right now. They can also expand mm -hmm. in, in, in other areas. I think that places such as Inwood, also I hope that should definitely be included. It, we cannot just planning on adding thousands of new apartments uh, in the next 10 years uh, for that area and not only relying on the A train, on the one train, and the bus. I think that, again, I hope that I continue working with you guys. And we will look at the possibility to see how a expansion of the ferry also happening, mm -hmm. you know, in the top of Manhattan. I feel also that ferry provide the opportunity to also bring tourists to go to the area beside the Midtown. Mm -hmm. When we had 65 million tourists that came here last year, you know, many of those come from city mm -hmm. where they have more and longest experience than not using ferries. So I think that we also have to look at this. As you know, we are also discussing the possibility to transfer Hart Island from Correctional to Park. Mm -hmm. And we would like to see also a possibility to put a, a ferry also stopping on Hart Island so that that million in the a very body that being buried in those in that island, they have family, they have relatives, they have loved ones that they would like to stop and see what's going on there. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, your point about the tourism economy is a is a very sharp one and a tremendous one. And Chair Ballone and his committee held a, a very thoughtful hearing on it uh, at the top of the World Trade Center that um, I think speaks to this well. Um, you've also been uh, loud and clear as a bell when it comes to ferry service at Dykeman Pier. Uh, we hear you. We are interested in it. And we will take a look at it when we look at expanding the system again. Uh, it is an exciting prospect, and we agree that as the neighborhood continues to grow and as we continue our work together on Inwood NYC, we will have to look at uh, other modes of transit to serve growing populations. Thank you. James just gave up our exciting locations for our hearings. Everybody's going to be going all over the place. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to raise the bar now on all the future hearings. Uh, we are going to turn it over to Councilmember Debbie Rose for the last comments for this panel. I just want to personally say thank you for the information and the ongoing dialogue to bring this to the next phase of the 21st century and beyond. Uh, as you can see, there is, there is extreme uh, excitement to grow it, make it the best it can possibly be get it to the areas that we can and, and have the best way to do that. And with that, Councilman Rose, for Thank you. the end of this panel. Um, I just wanted to ask EDC, um, where um, where are you in the process of uh, the free transfer from the ferry to um, the buses or subway? And is there some impediment to the implementation of that? 
the the transfer and the free transfer from the uh, the NYC ferry system to the MTA's network of buses and subways is a thing that we are very excited about and interested in, and, and that we have been uh, talking to the MTA about consistently since we launched the NYC ferry system, including I think this week on Monday or Tuesday. Um, they are moving to a new fare medium. They're replacing the Metro card with a thing they call One Metro New York. Uh, you may have seen it on the turnstiles at the subway. Uh, we're interested in being interoperable about it. Uh, they are not launching that new medium, we understand, until 2023 and are taking other transit systems uh, into consideration starting in 2021. We would love to have that conversation with the MTA, but that's the timeline we've been given. Well, I certainly hope it happens before 2021. Um, you know, if we have to do something in the interim until the new system comes on board. And, and my, my last question is for DOT and EDC, the same as um, I asked DCP. Um, what mayoral agency would you suggest that the Office of the Waterfront um, be housed um, since it has a very broad-based mission? I think Mike answered it well in saying DCP, we are in constant communication with them um, all the time, and uh, they, they, they do an excellent job, so I, I stand with DCP. Yeah. Thank you. I, I agree as well. The Department of City Planning has a cross-cutting function across city agencies and a role in the charter and the city's capital planning process, and I think it is well situated to take this agency coordinating role on as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I want to thank you all. Uh, for the work that you're doing. We're, so, we're very excited about uh, the progress that you're making and uh, we're going to be seeing in the near future and in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sure. Now let's get to the five panels. <laughs> so we'll have a two-minute time clock here. Uh, Edward Kelly for Maritime Association, part of New York and New Jersey. Chrissy Remain from River Keeper, uh, Roland, Roland Lewis, Waterfront Alliance, and actually these are the same people. And Cro, Crolina Salguero from Port, Port, Portside, New York. You can begin as soon as you're ready. Okay, okay we're ready. Whoever is ready, you can begin. No, no, yeah. sorry, then. Only, <laughs> only city agencies. Oh, no, I'm not going first. <laughs> I'll go first. No fear. You? Ladies you, first? That's okay. My taught me ladies first, so I don't want to get in trouble. Mine's too. Ma Kelly is 93 years old and was still a little <coughs> terrified of her. So. Good afternoon. My name is Edward J. Kelly, and I am the executive director of the Maritime Association of the Port of New York and New Jersey. Please accept my uh, comments as comments submitted on behalf of the over 550 paid corporate and individual members of the Maritime Association of the Port of New York and New Jersey. Uh, since 1873, we've been a primary advocate for industrial uh, interests and maritime industry in the port area. Uh, since its founding, the waterways and waterfront of New York City have driven the economic success of the city, making it a preeminent center for trade, finance, jobs, and real estate development for our city, region, and nation. We believe that when compared to other world-class port cities, NYC waterways and waterfront is grossly underutilized and neglected. I'm glad that we're having this hearing today. It's unfortunate that we were not able to have it in the Waterfront Committee, which the City Council had dissolved some time back. We're thrilled to see that there's a, a reemergence of interest and support for waterfront activities. Uh, and we have to understand that there is both jurisdictional issues in and on the water as well as on the land itself. Uh, we believe a safe, secure, and shared waterway front is possible, and we look forward to continued discussions aimed at making the New York City waterfront the best that it can be. 
Uh, I will circulate uh, my written testimony giving statistics regarding, but we do want to point out, as has been mentioned, our commercial maritime industry generates over 400,000 indirect full-time job equivalents, and due to the growth and massive infrastructure expenditures, including the 50-foot channel project, raising the Bayonne Bridge, Port Authority investment in expanded rail and access, deployment of ultra-large container vessels, all of these foregoing statistics are experiencing rapid and significant growth. A key point here is that as New York City makes plans for a future that projects an increased population, there must be planning for the movement of goods, people, freight, and services throughout the city. Waterborne transportation must be the cornerstone upon which future planning is based for, the, for, for a series of reasons, including currently underused capacity, environmentally friendly transport mode, it eases roadway congestion and takes trucks off the road, minimizes wear and tear on existing bridges, tunnels, and roadways, has very low cost to expand water transport infrastructure, minimizes impacts on environmentally sensitive communities, and it is the most fuel efficient transport mode. Regarding uh, 982, our specific comments are that if established, the Office of the Waterfront should not replicate the work or jurisdictions of neither EDC or DCP, but rather serve as an overriding or coordinating function to develop, implement, and monitor broad policies and affect cross-jurisdictional planning and objectives. The Office of the Waterfront should use the existing resources of EDC and DCP to create and implement plans for New York City waterway and waterfront that is diverse, safe, secure, environmentally sustainable, resilient, and economically viable. Since oversight of the Comprehensive Waterfront Plan and the Waterfront Management Advisory Board, as well as the Revitalization Plan, is already under the auspice of DCP, it would seem natural that the Office of the Waterfront would be housed within that group and that EDC would continue its efforts to incept and initiate creative enterprises to make optimal usage of waterway and waterfront assets to further the economic activities of the city. The Office of the Waterfront should be focused on overall... If you could uh, begin to uh, wrap it up. That's, that was that bell for. That was the bell. That's what <laughs> I thought. It's unfortunate. It's a, okay. We'll, 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 we're probably going to have questions, so trust okay. me. We'll get, we'll get to some of those issues. Well, our main issue is that the Office of the Waterfront should not replicate existing capabilities uh, and that this is a very complex and broad-reaching issue to look at waterfront. The Office of the Waterfront should be limited to oversight and not get bogged down in mundane issues that are already adequately and, and very effectively handled by other agencies, including Department of Parks, etc. Uh, basically, uh, I'll wrap this up. We stand ready to continue to talk, discuss, and bring this forward. It's in everyone's interest and the essential future of this city to provide waterborne transportation. Uh, it's just too expensive and virtually impossible to continue any other way. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Hi, I'm Christy Remine. I'm Riverkeepers Project Coordinator, and I genuinely thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. For those of you who don't know, Riverkeeper is a member-supported watchdog organization dedicated to defending the Hudson River and its tributaries and protecting the drinking water supply of 9 million New York City and Hudson Valley residents. As part of our mission, we sample water quality throughout New York City, monitor city shorelines for evidence of pollution, and fight to ensure shorefront development proceeds in a sustainable manner. As we've heard today, the terrain of New York's 520-mile coastline varies greatly from nature preserves, beaches, and boat launches to residential and heavy industrial use, from fertile wetlands to barren bulkheads. The greatest issue plaguing our shores today, however, no matter the use, stems directly from frequent sewage discharges during rainfall and the resulting poor water quality. In the near future, sea level rise will also impact nearly every single waterfront property. The complexities of these varied use, uses and the challenges they face warrant coordinated oversight from a new Office of Waterfront. Therefore, Riverkeeper supports Introduction 982, but we believe there are important changes necessary to make the legislation successful. First, it must be noted that a tremendous portion of the city's land would be effective. Activities occurring up to 800 feet landward on each roughly 520 miles of coastline would be governed by le this legislation, amounting to more than 78 square miles, which is a lot, <laughs> and um, 
So therefore, the council must provide it with the resources and funding necessary to hire knowledgeable professionals. The office must also coordinate closely with the existing Department of City Planning efforts. The unique challenges of waterfront resource planning already drove the city to create the Office of Waterfront and Open Space Planning in the Department of City Planning, which is just now beginning the process of, process of updating its comprehensive waterfront plan. Previous iterations of this plan have sparked important policy changes, uh, including the waterfront zoning that requires public access in front of new development, um, which is huge, as well as sea level rise resi resiliency measures um, and resiliency measures. It is our hope that the new Office of Waterfront will elevate these issues of waterfront planning and help build upon the Department of City Planning successes. And just a little bit more here. Crucially, our waterfronts are only attractive when water quality allows. The Office of Waterfront should include water quality protection as part of its mandate. All waterfront uses from recreation and aesthetic enjoyment to the ability to develop and operate businesses on contaminated waterfronts are directly affected by the water quality of the waterway. And I just want to add just one more little piece. Um, our sewage contamination problems, as bad as they are now, with more than 20 billion gallons of raw sewage just discharged into our waterways each year, likely will grow worse with climate change. Uh, 20 billion gallons is about 72 Empire State Buildings. Uh, so the Office of Waterfront should include, among its duties, the reduction of water pollution, safeguarding of water quality, and coordination of the city's water quality protection and resiliency efforts. Finally, the definition of body of water should be expanded to specifically include canals as well as tributaries to all of the explicitly identified waters. No waterfront, regardless of size, should go without the benefit of thoughtful city oversight. Again, Riverkeeper thanks you all. Good afternoon. Who is this one? There we go. Uh, my name is Roland Lewis. I am the president of the Waterfront Alliance, uh, uh, an alliance of over 1,000 businesses and civic organizations, including the three wonderful colleagues to my left and right, right here. We uh, applaud uh, 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 Councilman Rose's uh, uh, initiative and the 44 co sponsors that have uh, stepped forward uh, to. Uh, uh, pr promote this legislation, and I do do, do note that I was I took a little walk before. There were about two dozen people in the in the overflow room. This is an issue of great concern and importance, as and the five panels that you'll hear from. So very briefly, because I know I, the, the time is very limited. This we need a coordinating office. I, I, I'll up your 12 agencies. I believe there are 14 agencies in the city of New York alone, and then there's there's state and federal that uh, all have say in the waterfront. Other cities do this. They, they have a coordinating office where they, all these issues, which are the working waterfront, water quality, historic, uh, the historic boats, all come together and, and vet out issues. I'll give you an example uh, the, where we, we could have used it. Uh, this recent mayor's office uh, to uh, uh, the, the initiative on the infill project uh, for the financial district came forward. That has profound effect for uh, transportation, for historic boats, for parkland. All these issues could have been vetted. So having uh, an a, a mayor's office that could bring together the agencies within the city, uh, regional uh, players, that because we share the water with New Jersey and, uh, and, and, and also this federal jurisdiction, and with these wonderful experts that surround us and are going to be testifying before you, is critical. Um, uh, you know, even with an EDC itself, if you look at Hallis Cove in Astoria, they placed a ferry dock next to a um, uh, kayak launch and it, they were not compatible together. So it's a, coordination is so critical. There's an article in today's City Limits which talks about the uh, uh, Office of Recovery and Resiliency saying they don't even know where all the money, the billions of dollars are going. So there's so much to, I'll give you, give me another 30 seconds. There's so much to be coordinated. This office, this office, can, should have, uh, uh, I think, independence, should be a mayor's office. Think of the mayor's office of a disability. With all res great respect for my friend Michael and, and the incredible work they do there, um, there's so many different uh, avenues that, that affect public policy with the waterfront. Having a mayor's office at, well, similar to the dis disability independent uh, to uh, champion these issues and coordinate, I think, is, is the way to go. And then uh, finally, I, I, I've actually just <laughs> given a couple of examples where EDC has maybe fallen a little short, but I do want to uh, uh, talk about the the, uh, the, the transportation uh, bill before you too. The and just throw some uh, some praise 
in two years' time, a whole new system has been, it's a minor, I, I know one of the most, chief critics, he's written a lot about it recently, I'll let me name, nameless right now, but he, he said, I got to take my hat off to these guys when it first rolled out. To build that number of boats, to get this thing rolling, we have no really horse in the race about where this thing will lie over the long term, whether it be, is a city agency or a different operator at a time, but Hornblower and EDC have done a minor miracle to get this thing going as quickly and as fast and as efficiently as can. Let's give it time to grow. Let's find revenue sources that can uh, bring down the, the, the costs. Um, but let's do what the mayor really uh, asked us to do. Un find underserved neighborhoods that need transportation by water and make it at an affordable price. All right, Ding, I'm done. <laughs> uh, before you testify, I just want to recognize we've been joined by Council Member Levin and Kalos. Hi, I'm uh, Carlina Salguero uh, from Portside, New York. We're an award-winning maritime nonprofit uh, founded in 2005 in, in Red Hook. Uh, thanks for covering this. Uh, we are all about the waterfront. That's entirely our mission. So thrilled that you've picked this topic, though I have to say this really merits at least two hearings and more than two minutes. I mean, each of these topics alone is enormous. So. Um, and also, I would suggest in the future some more background information before it comes in. I mean, this was incredibly short notice. My apologies that our written testimony is terribly long, but it was like a scramble to try and figure out what's going on. So in terms of the Office of the Waterfront, what I want to say is that um, New York City is really notorious on the eastern seaboard for its being um, a very difficult place to be a boat of every type. Um, the way Portside puts it is that we've lost the fluency in the maritime language here. So we think it's a great idea to have an Office of the Waterfront. Um, like maybe Ed Kelly Maritime Association idea, it's being an oversight. Um, but we, what we don't need is another layer. We don't need more red tape. We have too much red tape here, and we have some questions about this. So, whether it should be a mayoral office, you know, that doesn't is not always a recipe for responsiveness or transparency. That makes it very much, you know, att attached to who the mayor is and their proclivities. Um, the other thing is, how is that office going to interact with some of the site managers? We have a situation. It's not just policy. Like DCP is making policy or rules or zoning or things like that. Our waterfront is actually chopped up in different management entities, huge numbers of them. And some of these are separate authorities, and they themselves are not very responsive. So the Hudson River Park Trust, that's a huge chunk of waterfront. Brooklyn Bridge Park, huge chunk. Governor's Island, another park. Then the EDC. The EDC themselves are landlords and are either owning and managing Dock NYC, not even mentioning the ferry things. So will this office have some suasion over them? Otherwise, what is it actually doing? And I feel like all the questions that I heard pertain to sounded more like construction permits. I'm talking now also about, you know, being a boat. It is almost impossible to be a boat in, in this city. We are still having troubles getting a home here. And I have to say, that's, a, I think, in large part about how the waterfront is run. Um, I founded the organization to make the city's uh, revitalization more maritime focused. And that meant maritime in every kind of way. We are very pro the working waterfront. We want to be on it. We work closely with it. But trying to get a space is really kind of impossible. In terms of the ferry operations, I concur, echo what Roland Lewis said. It is astounding what has happened. It's great. It's a fast start and whatever else. In terms of who manages it going forward, um, though we work closely with the EDC on some things, I'm very grateful that James Patchett himself allowed Red Hook Elementary School students to come present their transportation study. That was a powerful experience for the underprivileged kids um, from that elementary school. In the main, in all honesty, the EDC is not responsive to input from us, from anyone else, or to living up to promises that they make um, in many communities, including ours. And I'm sorry to put it to you. I'm a former you know, award-winning journalist. I'm going to be straight in a documentary voice, unresponsive, untransparent. And frankly, some things are just simple, and they're like basic suggestions, like the Red Hook stop. It's called Red Hook Atlantic Basin. There's not a single sign around Atlantic Basin saying Atlantic Basin. That is not a known term to people living in Red Hook. It's a mariner's term, historic mariner's term. People don't know where it is. The, the sign on the dock, we for two years as the EDC, the map does not include us. We are parallel to the ferry at a distance of like 30 yards. The map is almost blank. That's a DOT product, by the way. The EDC consistently refuses to have, we will pay for the sign and let them design it. And we're an attraction. And the ferry considers us an attraction. They promote all of our events. They promote our digital guide to Red Hook past and present. And we can't get the EDC to move on that. Similarly, the cruise terminal, and I mention this because the EDC runs the cruise terminal in the facility where the NYC ferry dock is. It was built as going to promote Red Hook business. There's not a single piece of information about Red Hook in the cruise terminal, on the dock. There's a no notification of special events. I was shocked this morning to see thousands of students 
entering the cruise terminal. I have the brochure. I got it from someone in the ferry dock as I came here. There was a free conference for students to understand business plans. And as far as I know, there was absolutely no notification in Red Hook or in Brooklyn anywhere that they could go to this. Kids could have just walked to this thing. And we have said this kind of thing over and over and over in the spirit of helpfulness and partnering. And these answers or these proposals, excuse me, are generally just rebuffed with no or with silence. And the EDC does a lot of great work, and I'm asking you all now to really talk to them to make them more responsive because they will perform better. But economic development includes indirect economic benefits. It includes this concept of customer service if you're running a cruise terminal and a ferry. And it's not just infrastructure. It's not just real estate management. And they need to do better. We would also like them to finally provide the home to us. And you didn't want to go first? <laughs> I always learn from I'm what playing, other people I'm say. <laughs> I'm not shy. I want to uh, turn it over to Council Member Rose. Uh, I, first, I want to thank you for being patient and being here. I just want to say thank you for um, all of the work that you've done um, on this particular issue and your input and um, for elucidating just how broad-based and multifaceted um, this is, uh, you know, when we talk about our waterfront, and um, uh, I appreciate your help in, in uh, bringing that out because I'm not quite sure if um, when we fir the first iteration of this bill really um, if, if the administration understood just how broad-based we were looking for in terms of coordination. So... Um, and oversight. So I, I just wanted to say thank you, really, for all the work that you've done. And I hear you, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about it. Um, That's further. great. So thank she you. just volunteer. Uh, <laughs> thank you for your leadership, and also uh, Council Member, uh, obviously, and Co-Chair Valone, uh, who uh, oversees uh, ADC. So that. I, I will encourage you to continue that communication with them. I only have one question, and that was in regards to the environment. We haven't talked much about the environment. I mean, yeah. uh, what kind of an impact do you foresee having more uh, of these large uh, maritime vessels uh, going through our rivers? And yes. <laughs> Larger. <coughs> the larger vessels are operating with the newest and cleanest uh, engines, the fuel consumption. There is more cargo being moved uh, per unit of fuel consumed. So the big vessels are a very good thing uh, as far as that goes. To handle the amount of freight, otherwise there'd be multiple vessels all requiring multiple tugs and additional support vessels uh, that would be putting more into the air. The good news is uh, internationally the IMO, uh, and again there are international regulations impacting our waterfront and the operators that work on it. The IMO MARPOL 6 uh, requires that there's drastic reductions in emissions globally for deep sea vessels. We already, once we enter the ECA, the economic control areas uh, of the United States, we have to reduce to low sulfur fuel. Most of our marine terminals have now been electrified, so we avoid the diesel engines. Uh, we've worked with through the Port Authority to reduce and mandate that older trucks are no longer allowed in our marine terminals, unlike the public facilities, warehouses, or streets. We will not allow old polluting trucks into the marine terminals anymore. And we've worked with a truck replacement program. So the maritime industry is very actively and aggressively moving to reduce. Now, on the other hand, domestically and locally, the uses of tugs, barges, ATBs, articulated tug barges, et cetera, in lieu of trucks. Uh, NYC did a study a few years ago that just with the, at the time, the existing tug and barge business eliminated over 1.3 million truck trips in the city every year. Uh, that takes a lot of pollution off the streets. The other benefit is societal. There's less wear and tear on bridges, tunnels, et cetera, that the taxpayers have to improve. Can anybody raise their hand and tell me they've seen a pothole in the water? <laughs> and as we've heard with the ferry landings, et cetera, uh, there's a lot of available land and very cheap infrastructure development costs for waterborne capabilities, both for people and freight. Uh, NYC is initiating the $100 million NYC freight program that's going to help to bring more freight 
and people onto the water. New York City is growing. There are more people projected to be here. There have to be environmentally friendly and physically capable ways of moving people and freight. And it's a lot cheaper to do it on the water than it is to try to build a new subway. And the very people that are talking about environmental impact want to put more buses on the road instead of ferries. Doesn't make sense to me. It's either yes or no. We're either cleaning the environment and having societal needs taken into consideration, or we're not. I mean, the subsidy for the ferries is because it reduces congestion, it reduces environmental pollution, it makes it capable for people to move. These are societal issues, and that's what government takes care of. Okay. I just, just add real briefly, this, it's indicative of the cross-cutting uh, issues that affect the waterfront and why the Office of the Waterfront was so necessary. Uh, you know, wake issues that the boats create, we are in tear on the water, uh, on the on waterfronts and waterfront businesses. Uh, water quality. If you want to build parks and have recreation, have kids do uh, programming down there, you got to deal with the CSO issue and, and increase water quality. So these are all, the, 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 there's a web of issues, and that's why this office could be so instrumental mm -hmm. to uh, uh, address uh, address them. Um, and I agree with everything you said about uh, about the ferries and, and getting trucks on. You know, the reason I was asking it, because I saw a study once regarding jet skis and lakes and the effect it has on marine life, uh, especially aquatic plant life, uh, a, a very negative effect. So I, I'm asking, so I really don't know what kind of effect does it have. Sure, yeah, and just to add a little bit there, I would say, uh, you know, as Ed mentioned, ferries and water transportation can, transportation can on a large scale, scale reduce GHG emissions and even reduce pollution on a local level. And Riverkeeper usually works by starting with the water and moving out. Um, but as we find with a lot of our communities that we work with, particularly in places like Newtown Creek, Flushing Waterways, um, these industrial area areas and corridors are really important and important to New York City. However, that doesn't mean that our waterways are highways and we uh, that you know we can use freely. We still have to very carefully consider the impacts of the increased ferry transportation that will likely come on those waterways. But that, again, is a conversation to continue. Okay. And you were going to say before we move to the next Yeah, one. I wanted to say um, last night I was at the Port Authority. They had a meeting about their um, the Port Master Plan. And so if you haven't um, met with them, I would encourage you to get that presentation because they're talking about some of what Ed Kelly says and some other additional things. Um, in terms of larger vessels, I also want to add cruise ships. So this circles back to another EDC issue. They promised shore power, which was actually installed years ago at the Brooklyn Cruise Terminal and is generally still not working or is irregularly working. And um, we can't get answers out of the EDC. Um, and so that should be one fixed and there should be answers because also they're planning to expand that to have larger ships coming in. Um, and that's a concern. I also think they're not about large ships, but the city has announced Freight NYC is a way to start moving things more by water, which Portside's advocated from since we were found in 2005. And then also there's an RFP out for Hunts Point um, to be moving things out of the um, Hunts Point market in the Bronx by water, which we also support. Um, and so there's a possibility for you know, using the waterways more. I also want to throw in the idea with the growth of the um, last mile warehouses, the kind of Amazon effect, you know, is there, and we braised this with the Port Authority last night, is there a way to start moving those kind of packages, for example, into Red Oak? There are at least four, if not five properties now that have been purchased to put in last mile warehouses. Can that stuff come into our neighborhood by water, partly because there's a port there, but just in general? Otherwise, you're trucking in and trucking out into a place like that. And, and in the case of Red Oak, right before the beacon. QE cantilever is going to be taken down. They're buying this property to inject more trucks. Well, thank you so much. Very informative. Uh, you took me to school. Thank you. Encantado. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Uh, let's move with the next panel. Katie Mosher from Billion Oyster Project in New York Harbor School. Kara Meyer from Plus Pool. Sean Campion from Citizens Budget Commission, Joe Hardigan from Rockaway Civic. <coughs> you can get oh, you, the, the sergeant. sergeant. Yeah, thank you. Focus on session, please. Private conversations outside. Private conversations outside, please. 
You can begin as soon as you're ready. And again, uh, don't feel obligated to read if you have a large testimony, if you, if you just want to go, you know, vocal and just get to the main points uh, within the time allowed. Okay? Okay. Thank you. Joe Hardigan from Rockaway, Queens, Ferry Advocate for 24 years. I attended all of the city EDC meetings on a pre-bid contracts for the ferry. I have some different concerns. I filed a complaint with the Inspector General and a few other things. You can read all that testimony there. Uh, I've heard a lot of misinformation given here on the cost of the train, tra train and the ferry. Uh, one of the things that I recommend, let's get back to EDC. We've all had problems with EDC. We're all frustrated with EDC. Since James Pritchett has come in, into being, as the, there's been less frustration. I would have to say that the new people that work at EDC with the ferry are doing a pretty good job. But anyway, you sit here and you talk about ferry service. Shouldn't you just do this? Ask C Street, a ferry operator for 20 years in New York Harbor, excuse me, no subsidy, and is building brand new boats will do 50 <coughs> miles an hour. He's going to probably bid on Glen Cove. If he bids on Glen Cove, then he could stop in the Bronx. He could stop in Bayside. What is the cost? You come here, I've heard the same thing at transportation meetings, you quote the same material over and over again. You have to come in here and have somebody that can verify what the costs are. Uh, EDC said a, a ferry boat cost, 150 passenger ferry boat costs $5 million. Well, Director Shipyard can build a 320 passenger ferry boat built in New York State for $5 million and do 32 knots. So you, you, I vote, did, you, did anybody on the city council read the ferry contract? It's 186 pages. If you didn't, or nobody on your staff did, how could you sit here and ask them questions? So anyway, the other city council member said about the ferry service into Rockaway. The average income where that ferry boat comes in is, is $48,000. He gave out misinformation. One mile each way of the ferry dock, it is only $48,000. And where the ferry dock is in Rockaway, it's in the middle of the island. There are things that can be done to reduce ferry costs. The Rockaway Ferry, for example, if it went into Kennedy Airport, we'd go to a voucher system. But my, my last thing is, I would ask Streak, you go on their boat, take all the city council members, so now that you know what it would cost to go from the Bronx, to go from Bayside. That's my suggestion to you. Thank you very much. My name is, <clears throat> sorry, my name is Kara Meyer. I'm from Friends of Plus Pool. Uh, we are, if you haven't heard of Plus Pool, we are uh, building a water filtering floating swimming pool in the New York Harbor. Uh, here's a little image here. Um, and we have been working, we're a grassroots environmental community driven effort. Uh, we had 11,000 signatures, uh, petitioners uh, over one month. We had 5,000 supporters on Kickstarter who launched the project. Um, and we, a couple years ago, formed a nonprofit. We now have sort of 100,000 people across the city through water quality programs, education, STEM, as we're working to uh, provide free and safe access to the river through Plus Pool. Um, Plus Pool, we, for the past four years, we've been working with the mayor's office to uh, both site and um, permit, or understand the permitting regulatory structure for Plus Pool, um, which has been crazy. Uh, talk about 12 agencies, yes, many, many agencies involved. Uh, in, but more recently, in the past three years, we've been working with EDC and um, small business services. Also still very confused about why small business services controls any of the waterfront or waterfront permitting uh, on a water quality project uh, and gone through the permitting and regulatory process uh, with the Army Corps and DEC and all of that. Uh, and so we're just here to testify that, um, you know, we, we truly believe that uh, an office of the waterfront would be very useful given all the experience we've had as a young organization coming through grassroots community efforts and not knowing anything about anything. Uh, the, you know, the online navigation system, sure, it's, it's informative, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a very, very detailed, um, involved process. And for projects that are unique like ours and, and super innovative, there's no existing regulatory structure, so you're kind of creating new regulations, and that's only going to happen more and more as we continue to go back to the waterfront. Um, you know, one of the main issues we've had in many ways is that who owns the water and who controls it, and it's, you know, different agencies across different areas. So, um, 
you know, we believe that the citizens can own the water. You know, it's only for us. Uh, and that's why we want to provide clean and safe access to it. And so that's why we support the, um, a, a waterfront office that can ensure that that continues to be true with all of the various projects we've been talking about here today. Hi, my name is Siobhan Williams. I'm reading on behalf of Billion Oyster Project and the Urban Assembly New York Harbor School. Um, there was someone who was here who had to leave early, so I'm just reading on their behalf. The Billion Oyster Project is a nonprofit working to restore oyster reefs to New York Harbor through public education initiatives. We work towards a future in which New York Harbor is the center of a rich, diverse, and abundant estuary, and the communities surrounding this complex ecosystem have helped construct and benefit from, with endless opportunities for work, education, and recreation. Through our work with schools, restaurants, and community members, we work hard to activate the, work, the waterfront in all five boroughs to provide experience and learning opportunities both at the water's edge and in the harbor itself through oyster restoration and education programs. The Urban Assembly New York Harbor School is a public career and technical education school located on Governor's Island. Harbor School provides a college and career preparatory education built on New York City's maritime experience that instills in students the ethics of environmental stewardship and the skills associated with, with careers on the water. Billion Oyster Project and Harbor School both support the establishment of an office of the waterfront, a coordinating body in the mayor's office to create and manage an overall vision for our 520 miles of waterfront is a critical step in building the harbor and city for the next generation of New Yorkers. Together, Billion Oyster Project and Harbor School work throughout the harbor, training students and restoring oysters. It is through this collaboration that students from all five boroughs learn to scuba dive, operate, and maintain vessels, grow oysters, and conduct research all in one of the busiest ports in the nation. Through this work, we work with a number of city agencies, landowners, and regulator regulators with interest in the harbor. While we enjoy robust relationships with each, we found that the patchwork quilt of overlapping jurisdictions is inefficient. A coordinating body that creates and manages a vision for the waterfront as a whole is necessary for bringing these separate efforts efforts together. Specifically, we would like to highlight the work of the Economic Development Corporation in playing some of this role with us over the last decade. The tremendous growth and popularity of the new ferry, ferry service is a testament to EDC's work and has brought over a million New Yorkers to interact with the harbor in new ways. EDC has hosted paid internships for a number of Harbor School students, providing valuable work-based learning experiences that have included waterfront projects from an urban maritime planning to EDC's freight, freight transportation initiatives in Brooklyn. EDC's Port and Transportation Department has organized highly successful and much needed maritime career aware fairs for New York City C CTE schools. This event has, has been hosted at Red Hook Cruise Terminal and connects our students with these much sought after career paths. Over 300 Harbor School students have participated in this event, even taking a New York City ferry to their fair crewed by Harbor School alumni captain and deckhands. What better inspiration for our students to pursue these unique career paths? EDC has participated in the citywide career and technical education advisory board for automotive and transportation connecting DOE industry professionals and educators to address industry demands for future workforce. Finally, EDC has always facilitated a great working partnership with, with Doc NYC for the Harbor School's training vessels. The support and collaboration of EDC has been instrumental for both Billion Oyster Project and Harbor School. The establishment of an office of the waterfront would build on this and other partnerships and allow us to continue preparing students for careers on the water and restoring New York Harbor to the great natural resource and public space it should be. Thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, my name is Sean Campion. I'm a senior research associate at the Citizens Budget Commission. Uh, CBC is a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank whose mission is to achieve constructive change in the finances and services of New York State and New York City governments. Um, in this time, I'll sort of give a British version of our testimony. Um, our report, uh, Swimming and Subsidies, identifies a number of the reasons why the cost of 
NYC Ferry have been so high to date, a number that have been mentioned earlier in this hearing. Um, the city has made choices to design long routes that are cost to operate to charter vessels uh, to meet seasonal and weekend ridership <coughs> demand, and to charge a fare that's equal to the subway fare rather than to, to premium transit options like express bus routes and other ferry systems which charge higher fares that are commensurate with their higher operating costs. And as a result, the NYC ferry system has recouped just 22% of its operating costs through fare revenue to date. Um, the bill before us today um, would call for transfer and control of New York City Ferry from EDC to a newly created director of ferry operations within DOT. Um, our report notes two of the drawbacks the, of the decision to operate New York City Ferry through EDC rather than through DOT. Um, first is transparency, um, as EDC is not funded through the city's budget process, which means there's little um, transparency to their finances or operations. DOT's expense budget for the Staten Island Ferry, by contrast, includes spe uh, reports spending on personnel, contractual services, supplies, fuels, and other expenses, and the mayor's management report ties back to those charges. Um, and EDC does not report a similar level of detail. Second, it creates redundancies within city government, particularly as EDC's role in NYC Ferry expands beyond um, merely overseeing onshore infrastructure and managing the relationship uh, with its private operating partner. Rebalancing the responsibilities between EDC and DOT could address some of these concerns. However, the council could require transparency into NYC Ferry's finances and operations without a shift of responsibility. Uh, furthermore, consolidating responsibilities for municipal ferry operations would reduce redundancy, but it doesn't guarantee improved operational efficiency or cost savings. Um, an evaluation of the relative efficiency and cost of EDCs and DOT's uh, ferry operations would help identify the cost impacts of these consolidations. And finally, and most importantly, um, consolidation would not address the policy choices that the city has made that's contributed to the high subsidies. Um, as we mentioned in our report, NYC Ferry is a product of a series of decisions about fares, routes, and service levels. Transparency would help New Yorkers understand the costs and benefits of these choices, but on its own, it's not going to make the system more effective, uh, efficient, or cost effective. Um, and we urge that the council should continue to use its oversight powers to consider whether the city should maintain the same operating strategy and fare structures going forward, particularly as NYC Ferry looks to expand by adding routes and procuring additional vessels. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, we will, our staff would literally is going to comb through all, all of your uh, written uh, comments that you have uh, for ideas. Thank you. We're going to move to the next panel. Molly Hollister from uh, Manhattan CB6. Frank Agosta from Local 1814. Roberta Weiss. Weisbrot, Worldwide Ferry Safety Association, and Captain Eric Johnson, Towboat and Harbor Carriers Association. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, Chairs Cabrera and Rodriguez, and I was going to say council members, but I think. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Molly Hollister. I'm the chair of Manhattan Community Board Six, and I will edit my uh, my remarks down a little bit, but you have the full full testimony there. Um, I'm here to speak in support of Intro 982, and um, Manhattan Community Board Six uh, stretches from 14th Street to uh, 59th Street in Manhattan uh, along the East River. Um, our waterfront has been. Uh, We've had it's been a priority for us for years. We've been focusing on it with a 197A plan and other, other uh, you know community-based plans as a focus. Um, it's been plagued by numerous problems. Uh, to mention a few, it's been impossible to walk the length of our waterfront because of our waterfront esplanade has significant gaps. Uh, it's adjacent to the FDR Drive, which of course is a big obstacle in a lot of ways. Um, a stroll or bike ride along the waterfront is not salubrious but rather noisy and unpleasant. Um, further still, multiple segments of the precious waterfront, little waterfront that we have, um, we have access to are occupied by uses that are deleterious, deleterious, deleterious to our quality of life, like parking lots and heliports. A lot of 99-year um, leases by EDC is what what we have along our waterfront, so um, with other businesses. The 34th Street Ferry Terminal is fantastic, and that's something that we, we love, and that brings a lot of folks out. But they need bathrooms, they need to be improved, and it needs to be made safer along that whole whole area of the waterfront. Um, if established, the Office of the Waterfront will serve a useful administrative purpose, but it will also serve as an advocate for the waterfront within city government. Through its work, that is what Manhattan Community Board 6 does, uh, we would welcome the Office of the Waterfront um, as an ally. Thank you very much. 
Thanks. Hello, um, I will be reading on behalf of Frank Agosta, who uh, couldn't stay. Uh, my name is Frank Agosta, and I am the Vice President of Local 1814, the International Longshoremen's Association, AFL-CIO, which represents longshoremen working in the Brooklyn sector of the Port of New York, as well as container maintenance and repair workers at both both Brooklyn and Staten Island waterfront facilities. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before this joint hearing of the New York City Council Committees on Economic Development, Gover Government Operations and Transportation. The maritime industry in New York represents approximately 3.6 billion in personal income for New Yorkers, while its inland waterways contribute about 300 million annually to the city's economic output. The Port of New York supports tens of thousands of jobs in New York City, some of which are performed by the longshore and waterfront workers represented by Local 1814. It is important to understand the pivotal role that the New York City Economic Development Corporation, EDC, has played and continues to play in the resurgence of waterfront commerce in the New York City sector of the port. The impetus of that resurgence has been the ability of EDC to garner and coordinate the support of many stakeholders in maritime commerce, including local community organizations, industry groups, employers, labor organizations, and other governmental agencies, not an easy task. It is easy, EDC's sensitivity to the interests of all those stakeholders that allows for the advancement of common sense proposals to increase the city's share of port commerce. EDC's formulation in 2018 of the Freight NYC plan demonstrated its ability to serve as an incubator for innovative approaches uh, to modernizing city, the city's aging freight distribution systems and increasing development of its maritime and rail assets. The objective of the plan is to increase maritime capacity, expand rail freight services, develop freight hubs, and utilize clean trucks, all while creating nearly 5,000 good-paying jobs and generating incalculable environmental dividends in the process. The use of container on barge or COB services is essential to the efforts to increase waterfront commerce in the New York City side of the port. It's a means for offsetting the use of trucks while substantially increasing the number of jobs involved in waterfront uh, cargo. In a recent example of EDC's facility for coordinating maritime commerce efforts with other governmental agencies was September 2018 announcement by EDC and the Port Authority to create the North Atlantic Marine Highway Alliance, which seeks to capitalize on the use of former container barges. In that context, EDC was also able to garner support for the support of DOT's maritime administration. So I won't continue because I'm over time, but EDC has a long-standing uh, maritime uh, background. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your testimony. We value it, and uh, we'll de definitely be feeding above whatever uh, you stated here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. thank you so much. And for the last panel, we have Captain, Captain John Napo, <coughs> Senior from Maritime Technology at King's College. Robert Boulder from Cornell University, and someone who didn't put their name uh, from SUNY Maritime College. And if that is you, we, we need your name. You, okay, if you could. If we, yeah. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you. Um, I'll be reading on behalf of Captain John Napo, Jr., who is the director of the Maritime Technology Program at Kingsborough Community College. Um, the Maritime Department at KCC has been positively impacted by maritime projects and programs designed and administered by NYC EDC. The NYC Ferry Program has had a tremendous impact on Kingsborough students and the program in general. For students, many have had their first real job experience working on the ferries. Working as deckhands, they can pursue their education while earning a wage for daily living and education expenses. The responsibilities and lessons learned on NYC ferries gave students an advantage for possible future employment opportunities in the maritime industry. We have also had many alumni who have made NYC Ferry their place of permanent employment, most working as captains and technicians in the engine rooms of the ferries. These are jobs that pay a real wage with benefits. For many of our students, it's a life-changing experience, a chance for financial independence, becoming part of the fraternity of maritime professionals, and from Kingsborough Community College's perspective, great ambassadors of our unique maritime program. The NYC Ferry program has become the foundation for a strong relationship with EDC. The relationship has raised Kingsborough's Maritime Program's profile in the New York Harbor to levels not previously experienced by the Maritime Department. EDC also sponsors 
a unique job fair for the last several years, the Maritime Career Awareness Fair. This event places NYC high school students and EDC Maritime Partners together to provide a career and educational pathways for students. Having two and four year colleges attending the event, students have easy access to and valuable information for making an informed decision about their education and future. Having maritime business partners there allow a student to possibly gain employment in, in an industry while exploring the chance to go to college simultaneously. The maritime program at KBCC has come to rely on this event as a marketing tool our program never had before. Being able to reach potential students from all communities in NYC at one time is beneficial for KBCC in every possible way. R raising the maritime program's visibility in a crowded educational market, meeting employers who could employ our students, connecting with shareholders about unique maritime programs previously unknown to staff at the college, the City University of New York has a hybrid education vessel, the CUNY-1. The vessel is operated by the KBCC Maritime Program. The Science and Resilience Institute at Jamaica Bay, hosted by NYC EDC, city council members, state senators, state assembly members, and shareholders in the Jamaica Bay community on the CUNY-1. The trip's mission was to find suitable new stops for increased ferry service to underserved communities in Brooklyn and Queens. And I'll just wrap up really quick. Um, none of these positive impacts on students at the high school and college levels would not have been possible without EDC's leadership on the ferry program and maritime programs throughout the harbor. We look forward to our continued relationship with EDC and its many collaborative partners for many years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Is Paulos, Paula Siegel here? Paula Siegel? No? OK. More please. Good afternoon. Um, I'll be reading a, a prepared statement of a letter of support from Mr. Robert Balder, Executive Director of College of Architecture, Art and Planning, NYC program with Cornell University. Uh, dear Council Members Valone and Rodriguez, on behalf of Cornell University's Col College of Architecture, located at 26 Broadway, I'm writing in support of two current bills that are uh, under consideration today for the establishment of Office of Waterfront and Director of Ferry Operations. It is my understanding that these two initiatives will continue to support and enhance the ongoing administration, operations, and expansion of the NYC ferry system. Cornell University is directly benefited from the establishment of ferry service beginning of August 2017 to and from Roosevelt Island for our Cornell Tech campus. The NYC ferry has also provided a critical link via the Astoria route where the College of Architecture is located at 26 Broadway. In addition to academic collaborations between these two campuses, a portion of our AAP students live at university-sponsored housing at Cornell Tech. The ability to commute quickly from Lower Manhattan to Roosevelt has been of great value to these students and faculty. The expanding ferry network has also allowed our graduate and undergraduate students to explore the city more fully, including urban planning workshops and architectural design studios, most recently in the Red Hook neighborhood in Brooklyn. Other areas of, of importance to our courses of study is re in re resilience include Queens West, Queens West, Hunters Point South, um, Gowanus Canal, the Bronx uh, River Corridor, and the Rockaways. And finally, cultural destinations like the Socrates Sculpture Park and uh, other gardens and museums, not, not very accessible by the subway or buses. In addition to enhancements the NYC ferry system and the associated benefits of all of an alternative mode of transportation, the Office of Waterfront will play a leading role in advancing and planning and implementation of the city's resilience strategy as outlined in multiple NYC reports and, and policy statements recently. Given the importance of these two initiatives, it is vital that the mayor's office have a dedicated group of professionals leading this effort in a sustained and targeted manner. And finally, the Cornell and NYC program has consistently collaborated with the uh, NYC EDC for almost a decade on a variety of urban planning studies, including significant portions of the city's waterfront and maritime sector. EDC has also been a strong partner in an academic internship program and has also hired graduates from our college. Respectfully, Robert Butler. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I guess I'm the last one, right? Um, so I'll be reading today on behalf of Amy Bernstein, Vice President for External Relations at SUNY Maritime College. Um, for close to 150 years, SUNY Maritime College, well, sorry, sorry. Um, SUNY Maritime College applauds NYC EDC for close to 150 years. SUNY Maritime College has been at the forefront of educating and training mariners and providing a large percentage of maritime workforce to the New York City region. Over the past several years, the college, its alumni, and students in and New York's uh, maritime industry at large have benefited greatly from the ambitious maritime workforce initiatives set forth by NYC EDC. In the past two years, NYC EDC has co-sponsored two important 
symposiums at SUNY Maritime. The first LG, LNG conference the, to study the growing need of in the sorry <laughs> to study the growing need in the liquid natural gas industry and how it will show impact of the maritime industry. Uh, the second focused on maritime highway uh, to address the, the need to reduce increasingly congested um, roads and pollution they produce. Mar marine highways and marine highways are developing enabled short sea shipping where freight and in carried over water, excuse me, I'm gonna stop. <laughs> carried over short distances um, in shipping operations. Um, with strong support from collabor and collaboration with partners um, as the NYCEDC, the college is able to address and respond to significant challenges, um, changes in the maritime industry. NYCEDC is investing uh, 100 million in infrastructure to, pr to promote and establish waterborne operations and uh, alternatives around the region. Andrew Gen, uh, seat, sorry. Uh, Senior Vice President of Portion Trans Transportation at NYCDC and, and his team have, demo have demonstrated a, a keen understanding of the understanding uh, for NYC's waterfront um, recreation as, long, as well as ensuring NYC's waterways continue to support transportation and economic development. NYCDC has championed that initiative and has successfully proved um, that no one else, that, sorry, that does not negate the other. Um, sorry, I can continue to read the letter, but I think it's submitted for the record. So I just want to make sure that you all have it. Since you're the last one, go ahead. You need 30 more seconds. <laughs> I will take it. Thank you. Um, so the benefit to all New Yorkers of waterborne, um, of waterborne transit is substantial. NYCDC has been instrumental in expanding the ferry service throughout the city. Since the Staten Island Ferry connects Staten Island and Manhattan, there existed an obvious growing need to expand the ferry service um, on New York's waterways. Fortunately, that has been met by NYCDC, by NYC Ferry, which connects residential and business communities along the East River, Brooklyn, Rockaways, Astoria, Soundview, and communities in Midtown and the Financial District. There are additional locations scheduled to open in 2020 and 2021. In an era of increasingly congested roadways, maximizing New York's waterways, the Blue Highway, uh, makes sense. In addition to streamlining, streamlining commuter traffic, NYC Ferry is essential in times of emergency when forms of transportation may not be available. In recent, no, the recent establishment of the ferry landing at Sandria in the Bronx proposed a landing in Ferry Point Park, and the proposed landing at Ferry Point Park um, provides SUNY Maritime College's students, faculty, staff, and neighbor residents a quick and expensive transit alternative between the Bronx and New York City's other boroughs. SUNY Maritime is proud to have trained nearly 25% of the crews um, who work on NYC Ferry. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for your testimony. And uh, in conclusion, I'd like to express uh, my gratitude to Zach Harris, who today is his last day in the council. He's a financial analyst. Uh, you always serve with such a dignity, uh, integrity, and uh, just a heart of service. It's, it's just a enjoyable, really enjoyable experience working with you. Mm -hmm. And with that, we'll let you uh, close today's meeting. Thank you, Council. <laughs> <laughs> um, roughly 25% of NYC crew.